So, uh, I wish a very good and inspiring debate at this conference. It's a fascinating topic. And let me now give the floor to Professor Marek Kornat, um, who we owe to a lot in terms of helping us to organize this event. Over to you, Marek. Ladies and gentlemen, there isn't much left to say after what the director said. Let me just mention that 1941, 80 years ago, is when some very important events happened, both from the point of view of the Second World War as uh, the largest conflict in hand. We have broadened the scope of this particular conference a little bit. And hopefully, um, this will cause some sort of a discussion. And it will hopefully result in uh, these conference uh, materials being published later on. We would, in particular, like to thank all our foreign guests who are going to participate in this conference in one way or another. And um, to uh, pick up on what Director Wojciechowicz said, Stalin made some concessions to Poland, and this was quite an exceptional policy as part of the broader policy of the USSR. So. Uh, even for this reason alone, it's an interesting exercise to deliberate on this topic. Now, this doesn't mean we should forget that uh, the idea of Polish-Soviet reconciliation, it, it just failed. The, the Katyn massacre was a time bomb waiting to blow up under these relations. And obviously, we mustn't forget uh, the fact that uh, the objective of Stalin was to impose a foreign regime on Poland. Let me thank the Center for Dialogue and Reconciliation. And uh, I think uh, this is it from me. Thank you. A uh, technical remark, you can follow our conference in social media and on YouTube in Polish, English and Russian. Over to Mr. Sławomir Dembski, head of the Polish Institute for Foreign Affairs. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be able to chair this first part of our meeting. Uh, we will have three eminent historians here. Professor Vladimir Nevezhin from the History Institute of the Russian Academy of Sciences. Professor Nevezhin is joining us online. I hope we have got the connection. Can we check if the professor is with us? We can see a part of the professor. Uh, professor, I think your microphone is mute. I wonder if something can be done about it. It's a pleasure to have you, Professor. We still can't hear you, but I understand we're getting close to the moment of when the mic will be on. Professor, can you hear us? Uh, very well. 
Hopefully, we'll be um, back in touch with the professor. I would like for the professor to be the first person to deliver his presentation. A very warm welcome to Professor Marek Kornat, who spoke just a moment ago. And uh, Professor Kornat is going to deliver a presentation on General Sikorsky and his attitude to the Soviet Union up until the outbreak of the uh, German-Soviet war, or the German aggression against the Soviet Union. And Professor Mariusz Wołos, who is hopefully also uh, somehow with us, although physically he's in Krakow. Right, there, there you are, Professor. The Professor will talk about the beginnings of Sikorsky's involvement in this relationship with the Soviet Union and his very first visit to the USSR in December 41. And this, by the way, is the event that uh, the anniversary of which we are um, in the middle of. Professor, uh, I can see you can hear us, but can you talk to us as well? I'm asking Professor Vovos. Again, we cannot hear you. Some technicalities are being solved, but I would like for us to proceed in the following order. The plan, at least, uh, is if we manage to overcome the technical difficulties, the plan is to start with uh, Volodya Nevezhin, who's going to talk about Andrei Vyshinsky and his first steps as a Stalinist diplomat. Now, Vyshinsky is less known as a diplomat. He's more known as a uh, prosecutor general and the author of the theory that if a suspect admits, this is proof of their guilt. And also that uh, force, using force, uh, is the best way of getting admission from a suspect. As a result, Andrei Vyshinsky, be, before he became a dipl diplomat, he had already become a criminal. And uh, we have to realize this full well, that we're talking about a criminal who participated in mass murder, mass repressions, and he was lucky enough um, not to have been uh, repressed himself. And then he was moved to um, diplomacy. But he supervised the introduction of communism in the countries, the, the Baltic republics, Latvia in particular, that had just been annexed by the USSR. Another important thing in the Polish context is that sadly, Andrzej Wyszynski was Polish by origin. Can you hear us, Volodya? Yes, we can hear you. Great. Okay, so we can hear you. Now, I would like to ask you, Volodya, to be the first to speak, and uh, you are going to talk about the first steps that uh, Vyshinsky took as a Soviet diplomat. So how did this um, come about? 
that he became a diplomat and also is it legitimate to say that his career in the um, in the Baltic republics and his achievements introducing the Soviet regime in the Baltic republics were significant enough for him to become the deputy uh, commissar um, in his later career. Over to you, Volodya. Hello and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues. It is a great pleasure that I hereby greet my uh, dear friends and audience. Let's focus on how directly Andrew Vashinsky stuck to his uh, duties. I will spare you the biographical information, but uh, I, I would only like to mention that he um, was born in 1883 in Odessa and uh, died in 1954. He was the uh, Soviet Union representative throughout his uh, active life. He was a prosecutor during political trials uh, between 1936 and 38. And after that, he experienced a major uh, upward trend in his career, so to speak. That's because in 1939, he entered the uh, Russian Academy of Sciences. And he did so as part of its uh, uh, theater department. He was uh, also a graduate of the University in Kiev, a lawyer by profession. Also, very briefly, uh, he ran for uh, for uh, a seat at the um, at the Central Committee, and rapidly so he became a member of the Central Committee and the party. His political career accelerated. He became uh, the deputy. Uh, Head of the uh, Russian go of the Soviet government responsible for science and culture. Mm -hmm. In nineteen thirty nine. Mm -hmm. He uh, also became the Deputy People's Commissar for Foreign Affairs, uh, second to Molotov, before his predecessor was uh, Patyamkin, uh, who at that time was, uh, uh, was holding office in, in Paris. He was also responsible for uh, education. And in 1941, he became the first uh, deputy uh, of the very Molotov. There are many different versions and uh, uh, apocryphs, so to speak, regarding the motivations that led to Vyshensky's um, appointment as Molotov's deputy. Before the war, when uh, Molotov and Stalin uh, were together um, conducting uh, subversive action. They they met in in uh, in prison. Stalin was uh, a constant follower, could be said, of Fushinsky's career, and the appointment could not have taken place without Stalin's uh, consent. That's clear. So Fushinsky and Molotov were both in. Stalin's uh, present at Stalin's office when the appointment took place. 
So what was in it for Vashinsky being part of the nomenclature, uh, being part of the central committee of the party? He obviously would uh, attend uh, uh, parties and uh, reunions to represent the Soviet regime. And when Stalin uh, celebrated his anniversary in 1939, he also invited a very narrow um, group of friends and co-workers, about 60 people. He invited them for a true feast for these 60 people. Among them, Vyshensky was also obviously present, him and his spouse. Even though Vyshensky was part of the uh, Stalinist apparatus, there's almost no trace today to well to, to trace back his his diplomatic path. We can trace his his way to the prosecutor's office and uh, his to his participation in the repressions and political trials, but not diplomacy. On third on the third. Uh, September 1940, according to Ponorienko, who was the third secretary of the party at the time, Stalin held a uh, another party in his dacha, and Ponorienko uh, wrote the following. Stalin's intention. Stalin said that it is time now to attract the Poles Probably what Stalin meant was, uh, what Stalin had in mind was uh, the German aggression against Poland at that time, and that uh, the Soviets should treat Poles different than the brutal Germans. On the 30th uh, September, Stalin apparently pronounced his. Uh, this this opinion, and uh, right after that, Vyshinsky ascended to a uh, to an important office in the party's bureau. It must be said as well that uh, a particular system of state security was in place at that time. And all uh, apparatchiks or high-level apparatchiks uh, were eligible for that kind of security services. So the political bureau members and others uh, only uh, six people out of 20 who enjoyed such security uh, were not members of the political bureau, and Vashinsky was uh, among them. According to the archives, in 1940, Vyshinsky was indeed um, protected individually in this particular way. At the same time, the same, in the same moment when Molotov took over the uh, Committee for Foreign Affairs, he uh, only had two deputies. First, Vladimir Nikonov in Berlin, based in Berlin in that time, uh, until 1940, permanent representative, uh, a permanent plenipotentiary representative of the Soviet uh, authorities, and Mr. Lozovsky, who was n n not a career diplomat. Therefore, Vyshinsky's uh, rival uh, was to probably to take off some uh, burden off of them. Vyshinsky's, Vyshinsky's uh, orders were always exclusive. 
which means that they uh, responded elect directly to his um, high-level position uh, in the uh, apparatus, in the Soviet apparatus. Brzezinski was a frequent guest in Stalin's office between 1940 until uh, July 1941. He visited Stalin's office 12 times, although we do not have full knowledge of what really happened during these visits. However, we do have records of these visits happening. Vyshinsky uh, did um, perform some important duties during his term. Uh, we must uh, remember that Molotov was his uh, principal. And uh, caused by Vyshinsky, Stalin uh, and Molotov would uh, converse. Uh, As part of uh, his duties, Molotov would uh, make inquiries and Stalin would respond via Vyshinsky, uh, give answers and directions and so on. And uh, these would be later denominated uh, as decisions of the higher-ups. He also uh, participated in uh, signings of important documents such as uh, the agreement with Yugoslavia in 1941. There's a picture of, there's a photograph of Vyshinsky uh, being there. And uh, 13, on the 13th of uh, April 1941, the agreement with Japan on neutrality, Molotov and Vyshinsky were both present. The UK ambassador referred directly to him in 1941 in order to convey a letter from Churchill to Stalin and that petition was, uh, uh, that request was granted, that message was conveyed. We do have some uh, more information, uh, too, according to the sources. For example, uh, Vyshinsky would uh, be present at the uh, functions in 1941 uh, representing the Soviet Union, uh, Rosa, a, uh, an Italian. Uh, the Italian ambassador invited Molotov, and Vyshinsky was on the guest list as well. Guest list as well. The deputy commissar for uh, foreign affairs was also among the invitees. In short, Vyshinsky would often take part in such functions, uh, not necessarily with uh, Molotov present. His um, duties were uh, pretty unique because everything said during these functions was, functions was noted down, jotted down by him, and conveyed further to Molotov. Vyshinsky was not a heavy drinker. He was usually sober and therefore able to record information, even though alcohol was flowing freely during these parties. In 1943, there was a visit of the People's Commissariat uh, Um, uh, to Kuybyshev, uh, there was an invitation from the, the American ambassador as well. And all these uh, notes are still uh, present in the archives. Uh, Vyshinsky would uh, jot it all down after meetings. During the alcohol intense talks, the conversations uh, were usually more honest 
therefore the information harvested by Vashinsky was then uh, conveyed readily to Molotov. Vashinsky's um, first steps as diplomat were very efficient. He was a lawyer and he was uh, uh, yeah, he had a vast knowledge of international law. During one of the first meetings, uh, there is a part of a dialogue noted down that um, Vashinsky would say that he was a lawyer and he was uh, very pleased to meet a fellow lawyer. A Bulgarian ambassador would jot down that uh, Vashinsky had a very uh, intelligent appearance, a bespectacled appearance, and yet very uh, efficient, very serious about uh, state affairs. A meeting with Steingart, a, uh, uh, the American ambassador, also um, <coughs> Uh, there's also, there are also written records of that meeting, and uh, Vashinsky's approach to Steinberg was very uh, hardline. He would apparently defend. Uh, he was a prosecutor at the trial. In 1941, he strengthened his uh, diplomatic position further. As I said, uh, he was very efficient. His career was going very well. Between 1941 and 1945, his career was uh, on the upward trend. Thank you very much indeed, sir, for this um, uh, biopic and uh, the picture of um, Andrei Vyshinsky's activity as a deputy foreign minister of the Soviet Union. A Soviet apparatchik, without any doubt. You have certainly mentioned uh, some uh, very curious details, and among them one that's particularly interesting for any historian. A dissonance of sorts, because he considered himself a lawyer and a connoisseur of international law. I would say that those repressed by him in the 30s would not have the same association, uh, would not say the same about him and would not associate him with uh, uh, strong legal principles. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to pass the floor to Mr. Uh, Marek Kornat and allow him to present the uh, views of General Sikorsky, uh, Sikorsky on the Soviet Union, on the Polish-Soviet relations from the moment he uh, became the head of Polish government. So from September 1939 until June 1941, so until the moment of German aggression against the Soviet Union. About these um, uh, men, first Andrei Vyshinsky and uh, then General Władysław Sikorsky appeared at roughly the same time uh, in the world of diplomacy, to put it very generally. They uh, took up or they were forced to take up uh, foreign policy responsibilities. They had never imagined before that that life would uh, go this way, I assume, and that they would have to um, fulfill their ambitions uh, as diplomats. 
słowo niejako ad vocem. Różnica jest tylko jedna. There's only one difference. We have to remember that uh, General Sikonski was head of government uh, for six months. Skrzyński was uh, the foreign minister, one of the best ministers we've had, but Sikonski was very active in terms of international policy. So this is just by word of a comment to what you said. Now, two, uh, two comments by way of introduction. Number one, we have to be able to tell the difference between the image of a foreign country in the eyes of a given politician or diplomat. And a different thing is the overarching policy or the, the concept of a policy vis-a-vis -vis that country. These two cannot be separated completely. So I'll try to talk about the policy concept, but my main objective is the image of the Soviet Union in the eyes and in the attitude of General Sikonsky in this area. Now, I don't want to keep repeating the following, but I, I need to make this uh, reservation and this comment. A historian has got to be able to tell two things, uh, a, a public statement and a private statement. A different thing is a statement made to a foreign diplomat even when they represent an, an ally. And there's a different thing, which is uh, a memo to oneself or to one's closest um, colleagues or in the meeting of a government, which by its nature is of a secret character. So, so just this comment uh, to be clear that there's a difference between public statements and private opinions. Now, the chair mentioned I would be talking about after Sikorsky became head of government. I think uh, it's a good idea to mention one more thing, something that emerges from the sources that I'm familiar with. Uh, Sikorsky wasn't just a strong critic of the Polish government, or I should say governments, after the death of Marshal Pilsudski. So that's the governments in the years 35-39. Now, the sources I am familiar with show that he was also a critic of the policy of uh, balancing out. Now, I'm surprised by this. I don't think there was any other alternative to that, but this is something that uh, was quite clear in what he said. In the last years of his life, during the war, Sikorsky made three attempts to keep a diary, something he called his notepad. And I will quote several parts of it, but let me start with a section from 1939. In the spring of 39, he started keeping a diary and without really being very particular about uh, uh, the wording and the grammar. Stylistically, it wasn't very thorough, even though he was a very good writer in his own right. But importantly, on the 13th of April, 1939, in this notepad, or a diary, as we should call it, and which he discontinued very soon after, he wrote, the criticism of Polish foreign policy includes five points. First, we kept rejecting an alliance with USSR. This is amazing to me. Second, we rejected the Eastern Pact. Thirdly, we did not defend the Versailles system. Fourthly, we were in favor of the Anschluss. And fifthly, we, be, we were neutral on the Sudeten case. Now, these are very strong criticisms. I don't even want to comment on them. 
These are statements he never made in public, even though he published a lot of articles in the Kurier Warszawski newspaper. Now, I'm not going to quote his public statements uh, at length. Uh, I would probably have to finish on the 1st of September 39, but there is so much material to work with. Now, the second issue is uh, Sikorsky's attitude to the Moscow negotiations for an alliance with the Soviet Union carried out by the Western powers and then also um, first through diplomacy, then through military missions. On the 9th of July, 39, Sikorsky wrote the following. He said, attracting the USSR to the Allied camp would mean that that country would give up the Rapallo line. And secondly, that would mean the, a review of the national activities of the Comintern, and it might bring about an internal evolution of the Soviet empire in a democratic spirit, end of quote. And my comment is that this doesn't sound very realistic, but Sikorsky has to be excused because at the time he had no idea that in parallel there were two sets of negotiations. The Soviets were negotiating with the Western allies and they were in the middle of consultations with Germany that would end up in the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact. In September 39, Sikorsky restarted his diary. Now, the tragic days in September, the 17th, uh, between the 17th and the 30th of September, when the Polish government uh, didn't really work for all practical intents and purposes. And Sikorsky wrote an even more harsh comment at the time. If historian avoids certain s sources, we, we cease to be a historian. So I need to quote this. What Sikorsky wrote was, Russia is doing now what Poland did to Czechoslovakia. It was to be expected. Russia suggested that they would come to our aid. End of quote. Uh, Sikorsky was certainly uh, very much upset. He was angry with the government. By the way, he wrote other important words in his diary. He said that the Polish government, uh, the cabinet, should be stopped from getting to France and recreating government there. And I, I don't think we need to comment on this anymore. Now, there are other thoughts in his diary that are about the Polish government, the, the pre-war government. Uh, but, but more about the international situation. Now, what Sikorsky says <coughs> is that in this game of Molotov-Ribbentrop, in this game. And then, again, I'm just summarizing this, but then he writes that the annexation of half of Poland gives Stalin a great starting point. He called it a first-class deployment point against the West. The global revolution has been made much easier thanks to that, he writes. And this is something that Minister Beck also wrote about. Uh, they're unanimous about it. And they said that Ribbentrop-Molotov unblocked for the Soviets the possibility to march westwards. And the general said... There are some other comments on the situation of Poland. He said, militarily, we need to support a little war in Poland. I understand he probably meant the underground forces, the, the home army. And he said, we also need to protect the country. And uh, in this light, we need to see this previous statement uh, that uh, Russia did to us what we did to Czechoslovakia. Now, there's one more uh, thought 
that I think is important. He says that if this conflict uh, gets any longer, Hitler will lose. Now, historians of diplomacy wrote a lot about the fact that in November 39, Sikorsky went to Britain. August Zalewski, the foreign minister, had visited Britain before. And Professor Batowski has written about it. It's clear that the British leaders, the Prime Minister, Prime Minister Chamberlain, and Lord Halifax, left him with no illusions. They said that Britain was not going to help Poland regain its eastern territory. Sikorsky mentioned this trip at the meeting of the Council of Ministers. He said that the attitude of Western powers to the Soviets is very complicated. The key issue is to prevent a closer alliance between uh, the Soviet Union and Germany. This is pretty much very close to what Chamberlain said. Now, what Sikorsky also said in that meeting of the Council of Ministers is that we mustn't do anything to push the Soviets into the arms of Germans. But Poles need to prevent the Bolshevization of Poland's eastern territories. With time, allies should understand the threat from the east and counteract it. Now, this sounds a little bit like wishful thinking. Ultimately, he says that the main objective is a complete victory against Germany and preventing the Bolshevization of Europe. Now, in a speech in December 39, addressed to uh, people in Poland, Sikorsky said that since the 17th of September, Poland has been at war with the Soviet Union due to an unlawful occupation of its eastern territories, and that in the light of international law, this was beyond any dispute. A big impact on Sikorsky's thinking about the USSR was uh, had by the, the winter war with Finland, Finland that uh, defended itself effectively. The aggression against Finland without declaring a war did not surprise him. Now, he did not know the content of the secret protocol the secret protocol in the Ribbentrop-Molotov Pact. This information surfaced in January or February 1940 in the French Yellow Paper, but uh, I'm talking about the end of 39, so the secret um, clause was probably unknown at the time. Now, the Soviets' failure to conquer Finland was also referred to by Sikorsky in a government meeting. He said that his opinion about the weaknesses of the Soviet army uh, was known for a long time. And being very clearly anti-Bolshevik is necessary, and one must consider the possibility of being in war, in, in um, live war with Soviets. And he said that uh, supposedly Russia wasn't consolidated internally, it's threatened from all sides, and the Finnish war showed the weakness of the Bolsheviks. As we know, Sikorsky was a proponent of sending a Polish corps to participate in the Winter War. Another very important moment of uh, the development of his opinions about the Soviet Union was something we know very well as historians, namely the trip of the Deputy Secretary of State, Samuel Wills, to Europe in early 1940. Roosevelt sent him in order to see whether this uh, new war was possible to be stopped. He went to Hitler, Daladier, Mussolini and uh, Churchill. And Sikorsky met him in Paris. Uh, Sikorsky talked to Wells, but he summarized his uh, conversation in a government meeting. And then in March, 
because the meeting was in March. In March, he had Ambassador Ratinsky translate a memo on uh, the war, which was uh, then given to the American politician. Now, some places to be quoted from that particular meeting of the government. Nothing very much surprising, but very important to understanding the Soviet Russia. I believe it makes sense to well, just talk about the participation of the Soviet Union in preparing a great moment for Germany to start the war. He said that the war was prepared, planned, and started by Germany. So it's Frederick II, Bismarck, Hitler, three representatives of a policy of violence, as he called them. He capitulated against barbarians, and that the worst threat to humankind was an alliance between the Soviet Union and Germany. He defended the Italian dictator. He didn't agree with Wells. He said that Mussolini shouldn't be compared with Hitler, that it's a different category. And then he also expresses a new line of thought. He said that there was this close alliance between Russia and Germans, and that Russia is giving a lot of uh, support economically to Germany, which was true, obviously. He said that the Soviet, um, uh, Soviet uh, leadership hates Western democracies as much as Adolf Hitler does. Uh, he also said that uh, the aim is to destroy European democracies through a global revolution, and this pact is a prelude to it. The fall of France in the summer of 1940 was mm, a huge tragedy to Sikorsky. He believed, he was one of the people who believed that France was a key element of the system of power. And he restarted his diary at the time, and he said the strategic and political situation is completely different now than just a few months ago. France was removed from the continent, uh, continent even though it was a natural enemy of Germany, which brought it closer to Poland. And he said, France will never rise up again to become the helmsman of the continent. He said, uh, rapprochement is needed with the Soviet Union now. And this statement of Sikorsky in the summer of 1940, which was expressed in the Litawa memo, th this has to be uh, construed as a reaction to the fall of France. The Litawa document was on the 19th of June, 1940, quoted in London, in a publication in London, includes a number of important ideas. First of all, there's a guarantee declaration given to the Soviet government that the policy of rebuilding Poland will be fundamentally different from all the governments after 1920. It will not be targeting Russian interests in any way. Secondly, uh, they demanded the restitution of status quo, but the Polish government was prepared for territorial changes in terms of the Belarusian and uh, Belarusian territories along the eastern border. And finally, the Polish government expected a change of the Soviet policy against Polish citizens under German occupation. And finally, the last thought, which is best known, that a Polish army was to be um, established in the Soviet Union. Now, at that particular time, there was still the informal alliance between Moscow and Berlin. We know that this document was cancelled, and Amb Ambassador Raczynski wrote in his diary, and he says, it's uh, very clear that the comments in this aid memoir are not to be construed as giving up our fundamental rights, which were breached by the aggression of the Soviet Union. 
Now, these are two different concepts, d different theories. One was to win the war against Germany and the concern about the situation of the Polish population. On the 15th of August, 1940, the main lines of Polish foreign policy were adopted by the Council of Ministers. This is after the government moved to London. And these lines include four statements. It's possible to change the attitude to the USSR by the Polish government. Secondly, all Polish rights have to be reinstated, including the territorial status quo ante from 1939. Thirdly, they talk about an evacuation of the territories annexed by the Soviet Union in, on the 17th of September 1939. And finally, uh, there's talk about um, establishing a Polish army in the USSR. Now, in July for 1940, right before these lines were published, Sikorsky talked to Stafford Cribbs, who was on his way to the Soviet Union, and they talked about the Soviet policy. One particular statement, I think, is particularly noteworthy. He uh, tried to persuade the British politi politician that the Soviet policy against Poland was ludicrous also from the point of view of uh, Russia's interest and that uh, by his short-sighted policy, Stalin made things easier for Hitler. Now, this is a change against his old statement that, Sta uh, that Stalin won that particular game against Hitler. But let's remember that this is an external statement, not his private thought. In late August or early September, Sikorsky restarted keeping his diary. And there's a short quote I need to give you. It's very important. Let me quote this. It's very important what our attitude to the Soviet Russia is. This attitude should be consistent if we are to reach uh, any long-lasting collaboration. The government that I'm head of has a clear opinion on the Soviet uh, Russia. It's not as provocative as Minister Beck's policy was. On the contrary, it's about a neighborly cooperation with Russia. But goodwill has to be had from both sides. It's not there for the Bolsheviks. They changed their attitude under the uh, Bolshevik in the um, territories um, annexated by Russia. We used to be very harsh on them. Now it's much more lenient, which I'm happy about. But we need to make sure that we understand that the that is very far away from them changing their attitude to Poland. They have occupied nearly half of the of our country. The game between Germany and Russia isn't mature enough to expect any significant changes. If there is goodwill, however, then with British mediation, we might find a way of fixing the situation which is untenable because of Russia. Right now, we are hearing that even the recent changes in the attitude of Bolshevik attitude uh, towards us are being played out by the Bolsheviks against Britain. I'm not sure what this last sentence meant. It might refer to some sort of media speculation. And there's one more passage which is very interesting where he criticizes uh, Czechoslovakia, the, the foreign policy pre-war of Czechoslovakia. And uh, he said, um, again, in an internal notes that they were played out by the Soviets. And finally, he said that the November talks of Molotov with the Ribbentrop and Hitler in uh, the Sikorsky and others. But uh, his many statements suggest that there was some sort of diplomatic campaign that will result in a crisis between Berlin and Moscow. In the run-up to the German aggression against the Soviet Union, which overturned the system of uh, power in uh, Europe, it was nearly on the eve of the aggression that Stafford Cripps met with Sikorsky on the 19th of June. 
Uh, they talked in the morning. In the afternoon, they had a meeting of the Council of Ministers. So it was on the same day. And I need to bring your attention to this particular day. When talking to Cribs, Sikorsky heard that the Soviet Union stood no chance of surviving a German aggression, and that there were signs of this aggression coming up. Russia was weak. The German ar army would march into the interior. Uh, the Bolsheviks will break down, and there will be a general crisis of the country. Now, Sikorsky said this was not the case. He said that Russia had a huge reserves of uh, the human power and territory and resources. And he said that in defense, Russia could be much, much more surprisingly strong than what it had shown in Finland. And there was, for example, an idea of sending a Polish representative in a diplomatic function to Moscow. Cribs said, said that Moscow wouldn't agree to that. And finally, in on the radio delivered when he had learned about the German attack on the Soviet Union, he said the following sentence, what we had been expecting has happened, even though we didn't expect it to happen so fast. That's a speech on the evening of the 22nd of June. And finally, just my very last statement. Uh, first of all, I'm very much surprised by the fact that Sikorsky went so far in the criti cri his criticism of the policy of uh, balance. He didn't know Russia. He only visited it once during his visit to Moscow. Thirdly, it's not very easy to, for me to see whether he saw what was his opinion on Beck, Minister Beck allowing the Soviet army in. And finally, he is the Soviets. And the very last thing, he thought that the Soviet Union was not destined to fail in its war against Germany. So these are some of the key aspects of uh, Sikorsky's line of thought about the Soviet Union. As you can see, thank you very much. Hopefully we'll, we'll have enough time to come back to this. Thank you very much. You mentioned the Soviet factors and uh, the, the, the Soviet uh, leadership and its attitude to Sikorsky, which bring us very neatly to Professor Vovos's let me thank you for inviting me to this um, to this conference. I will try to keep my presentation to the twenty minute to the twenty minute limit. So I'll be reading extensive passages from my uh, article because this is going to be faster. Half a year after the visit of the Polish Prime Minister General Sikorski to the USSR. Bogomolov, accredited in London, wrote his report to Molotov the following, and I quote, Sikorsky is a Polish nationalist, but he's supported by England, and he works upon English orders, so he's careful, uh, trying to make the objectives of the English imperialism and the Polish fascism come true. Sikorsky's visit in Moscow was aimed at visiting the army and having a look at the situation, which was hard for us at the time. His visit uh, failed to deliver any results. The loans he received were uh, received a pretty cool and they welcome here because they just formalized the status quo. Uh, the angry emigration believes that we have an unpayable debt to Poland, and if we are doing anything for the Poles right now, it's a great feat and a lot of understanding on the side of the Poles. I'm obviously talking about today's nobility in Poland, not about the Polish nation whose attitudes are 
unknown to me. That's the uh, end of the Bogomolov quotation. Now, uh, leaving the ideological slogans to the side uh, and his clear uh, negative attitude to the uh, Polish authorities, um, we should uh, ask the question whether his evaluation of Sikorsky's visit to the USSR was valid. And this is the main line of my um, considerations here. I have to point out that in this period, Soviet diplomacy was just of an auxiliary or sort of administrative or organizational character. During the military conflict, diplomacy very often is uh, sidetracked, but this also stems from the characteristic features of the Soviet system, which was a fully-fledged Stalinist totalitarian system with a very vertical power structure. In any significant issue, it was the dictator who had the ultimate um, say. The same happened as far as the uh, visit to the Soviet Union was concerned. Now, the documentation I've analyzed has some uh, clear um, evidence of that. Sikorsky's visit to uh, Moscow, the idea of a visit like that appeared in the uh, Soviet diplomatic documentation in October 41. On the 10th of October, Ivan Maisky, who knew the Polish politician very well, wrote in his diary that Bogomolov uh, came to him in the evening mentioning Sikorsky's decision to go to Moscow immediately. And uh, as a reason for that, uh, Maisky said that the Polish politician wanted to show that he had uh, very friendly relations with Soviets in what was a very critical period of time, irrespective of the fact that the Polish army being formed in the East wasn't ready for combat. This accelerated quickly. Bogomol, two days later, received your instruction from his uh, higher-ups to convey a positive answer from Moscow to Sikorsky. On 14 October, during a meeting of the Polish ambassador Stanisław Kot with the deputy commissar for foreign affairs, Andrew Wyszynski, it was confirmed that Sikorski was going to be received, and I quote, according to international standard. It wasn't a precision, a precise answer for the request to uh, to invite Sikorski as a guest of the Soviet government. Wyszynski uh, underlined that this initiative was Sikorski's and not Moscow's. I'm underlining this because this is uh, this matters for uh, propaganda and uh, it puts the Polish leader in a petitioner role, uh, respect uh, in view of his uh, Soviet uh, of his Soviet counterparts. The counterparts. Kot was going to. Uh, pursue this topic in order to uh, accelerate uh, the release of Polish uh, Polish prisoners, accelerate the process of army forming and uh, relocating the uh, military to where the British supplies were better accessible and evacuation of 15, 20,000 um, soldiers to the UK and Egypt. All this uh, failed. Sikorsky's visit did not change a bit. During the meeting with Polish ambassador on 22 October, Molotov said that he uh, understood well the objective of Sikorsky's visit. However, he didn't want to directly confirm that uh, whether that visit was still uh, desired by the Soviet counterparts. He uh, also pointed to the possibility of acquiring of um, hosting the Polish leader in Kuybyshev and not in Moscow, where uh, the central Soviet organs were gradually being transferred. The date was not set. Molotov said that they they would that he would convey everything to Stalin and uh, inform Kot about the results. 
it dragged in further respect the date and the uh, character of the visit and it will all depended on um, the Kremlin leader during the upcoming weeks the Polish ambassador was conveying messages uh, from his Soviet interlocutor uh, from his Soviet com counterparts on uh, General Chikorsky's tour in northern Africa and uh, and the Middle East. However, he would not receive any concrete information in return. This changed uh, mid uh, November 1941. <clears throat> the turning point was the conversation between Kot and Stalin on 14th November. During a two hour meeting, attended by Molotov as well and the uh, first secretary at the Polish ambas embassy, Wiesław Arlet, the Soviet dictator said symbolically, if Sikorsky, and I quote, if Sikorsky comes to the Soviet Union, he will be our guest and we will find, we shall find uh, a common language with him. Stalin would inquire about the date of his arrival, but Kot would not, was not able to reply because he did not have uh, direct contact with Sikorsky at that time because Sikorsky was in Egypt. But on the next day, Molotov received caught and uh, discussed uh, all matters uh, referring to Sikorsky's conversation with Stalin, and inc including the uh, location of Poles in the Soviet Union, the Polish army, and the supplies for its soldiers. The Soviet uh, chief diplomat suggested that it would have been a uh, better to uh, host Sikorsky in Kuybyshev first and then choose the correct moment to come to Moscow. However, he would uh, point to the necessity to consult other, other members of the Soviet government, in particular Stalin. Kot would uh, speak to Solomonov, the deputy chief of uh, Soviet diplomacy uh, in order to precise in order to uh, determine the precise date at the uh, committee for foreign relations the uh, preparations were um, were going on on 15 November Georgi Pushkin prepared the characteristics a dossier of Polish premier of Polish prime minister the document was uh, based on the information of the Soviet uh, Foreign Ministry, Fourth Department, European Department, where Pushkin was a deputy, uh, deputy head. It was definitely a document dedicated to, uh, it was definitely a document uh, for the top level, top echelon of uh, Soviet uh, leadership. First, Pushkin, underline the political path of the Polish Prime Minister from the uh, closest ally and admirator of uh, Józef Piłsudski to becoming his uh, opponent. This is not a coincidence because it also uh, played well in hand with the uh, declarations of uh, Sigorski himself, who would, uh, who would uh, deny the uh, views of uh, Pusutskis and Beck's allies later on. Also, a lot of uh, information was provided on the Soviet-French pact on, uh, uh, on mutual support in 1935 and uh, Sikorsky's views on that. Now, as uh, Professor Karnat has said, that notwithstanding the uh, position of Polish government, Sikorsky was actually an ally of such uh, solutions promoted by Moscow itself. Not only the pro-French stance and the anti, but also the anti-German stance of Sikorsky was underlined, um, and his alarming. Um, his ringing the bell of alarm uh, against the Third Reich and his book um, of 1934. Also, it was underlined that the Polish Prime Minister was uh, had a decisive role in uh, signing the 1941 agreement between um, the Polish government and the Soviets, uh, notwithstanding the uh, objections of August Zaleski, General Sosnowski, and Marian Zeda. Pushkin added that Sikorsky's uh, 
the declarations made after the London Agreement uh, on the inviolability uh, of Polish uh, borders from 94 to 39 were adequately reacted to by the press, by the Soviet press. Pushkin mentioned also uh, the Pushkin's um, Pushkin's uh, information demonstrated certain sympathy, a certain um, affection even to uh, Sikorsky's actions and views in comparison to other uh, Polish political figures uh, of that period. It's hard to say whether this uh, document would serve only for certain uh, general orientation or whether uh, they would they were to convince uh, to the benefit of Polish head and prime minister. This is not even a rhetorical question. This is a rather subversive one, given the uh, given the uh, actual uh, course of the talks of Sikorsky Kremlin. I uh, I would say that it was generally to inform. Sikorsky's visit to the uh, Soviet Union was uh, interesting for the entire diplomatic corps. Zdenek Fielinger, uh, Czechoslovakian ambassador, was inquiring about possible agreements to be signed. The vice deputy, the deputy of Soviet diploma uh, diplomacy, um, denied that that any uh, agreements had been already signed. We know that the agreement uh, signed on 4 December 1949, joint declaration of Polish and Soviet government, very general in its nature, was a rather spontaneous initiative. We know that today. I'm not going to uh, reproduce uh, the entire visit of John Sikorsky in Soviet Union and the talks that he held there. These were analyzed thoroughly, have been analyzed thoroughly already. However, I'd like to point out certain matters, not only concerning the Soviet diplomacy. Vladimir Nevyezhin, a participant to our conference, by the way, um, discovered that the meetings with Stalin and particularly the party on 4th December 1941 had been prepared uh, to a large scale and to a great attention to detail, uh, particularly in view of the wartime. We could, for reference, we could use uh, other parties, other diplomatic parties, uh, thrown for um, similar uh, level diplomatic um, diplomatic delegations. The protocol, the Soviet protocol, prepared a program for Sikorsky's visit to the Soviet Union, signed by Fyod by Fyodor Morchkov, the head of protocol. And the last item of the document mentioned that uh, the uh, highlights of the visit should be uh, filmed, should be recorded, which must be underlined. On 1st December, Sikorsky, accompanied by Stanislav Kot and General Władysław Anders, met in Kuzbyshev, uh, the head of the top committee of the uh, Soviet Union, Mikhail Kalinin, so the nominal head of state. According to Vyshinsky, who attended the meeting, both Sigorsky and Kot were very much opposed uh, to Piłsudski and his allies in the context of uh, not only Soviets, but also Russia. It wasn't very common in these uh, in these times. It was all recorded on tape, on videotape. Sikorsky's visit was uh, uh, reported in main uh, Soviet press organs such as Pravda and Komsolovska Pravda to Izviestia or Izviestia. Stalin assented to a radio broadcast and um, to the Poles in Soviet Union and those under German occupation. He promised to interpret these words into many languages and allowed him and Buzuk to uh, address the soldiers of the future army. 
However, the uh, Soviets would not fulfill all his wishes. For example, during the conversation with Wyszynski, the Polish uh, leader wanted to uh, visit with General Anders, uh, General Tadeusz Kimetski and uh, Michał Protasiewicz, some part of the front line um, under Moscow, next to Moscow. However, the deputy head of Soviet diplomacy uh, said that he wasn't competent and uh, promised to convey the uh, request to um, to the military leaders. However, that request was not fulfilled. At the end, I'd like to give the floor to Bogomov, who, when Sikorsky was leaving, said, among the Poles we have here, Sikorsky is the smartest, but he is not a heavyweight because in, he is trying to uh, balance different positions. He's brave, he's politically determined to conduct bourgeois revolutionary actions to throw out the allies of Piłsudski and Beck uh, to give land away to uh, to uh, the to the people, and he he would like to keep both the nobility and the friendship with Stalin. He like to become the main representative, plain potentiary of the English, uh, to fight communism in Europe and live in love with the Soviet Union. Then Bogomolov would keep on babbling about the polls in London and uh, he would uh, be unsatisfied that Sikorsky's uh, hosting by Stalin would not change anything with the uh, relations with Polish emigration. Bogomolov uh, also added that uh, it must be reminded of the Molotov's address from the 17th September 1939, and particularly the fragments on Polish authorities' capabilities. He made clear conclusions. Lots of pompous honor, but no smart mind. He would go further saying that Polish fascism is similar to the German one in many in many aspects. It's impossible for me to say whether Bogomolov was writing what he really thought, what he was really thinking, or whether he was cautious, or whether he wanted to uh, paint himself a good picture. It could be all uh, at once. Let me get back to the question posed at the very beginning similar to Bogomolov's declaration that Sikorsky's visit in the Soviet Union was fruitless. However, my point of view is different than uh, the Soviet diplomats' one. Yes, the travel of the Polish leader to the Soviets in 1941 did not solve any key problems in Polish-Soviet relations. Hundreds of uh, thousands of Polish citizens in the Soviet Union uh, did not notice any change. The problem of their citizenship would uh, again become um, become urging. The question of the border of Poland Soviet Union was uh, suspended. The very initial problems of the Polish army in the east were not solved, All, uh, even though hundred the number of 150,000 uh, soldiers were mentioned to be recruited in the Soviet Union. The destiny of Polish uh, officers, policemen, policemen and uh, officials being searched for was not clarified because the Soviets didn't want to. Sikorsky was lied to uh, as well as his allies. For some reason, Stalin uh, agreed to host uh, the Polish leader. 
Uh, what's more, he uh, ordered the visit to be prepared uh, in great detail and uh, use it for propaganda matters in press and uh, to record on film. The message did, uh, uh, the message was sent and uh, was destined to probably to Soviet uh, citizens as well as to the international uh, opinion. I'm not sure whether Sigorsky was aware of all this. Uh, that he was uh, made propaganda of. However, it was the case in summer 1940 when uh, the British, Winston Churchill, uh, at the helm, were showing that uh, that they were leaving no one behind, that they did have allies, and that nobody would fight the Germans uh, alone. Stalin copied that in a different context, however. The Soviet dictator knew that after the Great Terror and the Polish operation, the name KVD, very well remembered, the trust to the Soviet authorities was uh, limited at best and very volatile. And it could uh, come to zero under German blows in a period most difficult for himself. He cared for the loyalty of Soviet uh, citizens, citizens, Poles included. The anti-Soviet sentiment in the Polish army in the East was uh, conveyed to Stalin uh, by Wawrinty Beria, the head of NKVD, even on the day of arrival of Sikorsky to the Soviet Union. The Soviet dictator must have known that many Poles, both occupied by the Germans and the Soviet, Soviets, uh, was happy to hear about the war between the Third Reich and the Soviet Union. The 1941 failures of the uh, uh, of the Red Army was not their concern, uh, concern too. They were loyal to, the, to Sikorsky's government. They would follow the Polish government in London. And in order to limit anti-Soviet uh, sentiment, the Polish leader helped Kremlin, actually, uh, and inadvertently. Once the Germans was, were pushed away from Moscow, his relevance uh, would certainly diminish. The visit must have been uh, must have been advertised and used for all possible propaganda matters for the world to know about the uh, uh, ally nature, alliance nature of the relationship. It was easier because Sikorsky had different motives and it was his own initiative to travel to uh, the Soviet Union. Bogomov was wrong to say that the visit was fruitless. It uh, bore many fruits to Stalin and his allies in very concrete but uh, difficult to measure categories. Thank you very much for your attention, gentlemen. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you, Professor. We've got uh, some time uh, left still for uh, uh, any questions or doubts or comments you may have. Please, the gentleman in front, please um, introduce yourself. Right, just two issues. There isn't much time for discussion. If I understood you correctly, Marek, you said that Sikorsky didn't know about Molotov's Berlin visit. No, not about the visit, about the cause of the visit, about the content of the visit. He read the newspapers. He knew what the media wrote about it, but didn't know the actual content of the visit. Right. Now, secondly, just to give some rationale to this uh, image of Sikorsky in uh, the period 1939-43. In your presentation, there was uh, some sort of uh, wonder or surprise that Sikorsky was that critical and that, that in late our papers, he was even ready to hand over some territory. Now, Sikorsky had one very important feature. He was a political realist, which sadly many Polish politicians didn't have. Sikorsky knew that what is 
rights for national interest is one thing, but what is feasible is a completely different thing in these difficult conditions. And this is what I think makes it clear why he was ready at that period when Hitler ruled over um, Europe, he was considering granting some territory to the Soviets. And secondly, there's this psychological mechanism. If you criticize a government very much, and he was a very big um, opponent of uh, the Sanatia regime, he was a Democrat. So if you do that, then you assume that uh, the bad Polish-Soviet uh, relationships partly um, stem from the government in Poland and in the, the Soviet Union. Thank you. And we've got another person here in the floor. Jacek Tebinka, University of Gdynia. It was with a lot of interest that I listened to Marek Kornat's uh, great presentation. In terms of the sources which you used, it's very interesting to show what Sikorsky really thought during these key days. And I don't think uh, there is any contradiction as far as the German Soviet relations are concerned. Now, events confirmed that Stalin benefited more in 39 and 40. Hitler was frustrated at the time, as we can read in Mr. Nemsky's book. It was, uh, Hitler was frustrated that, he, that Stalin, without paying much in terms of the costs, was gaining a lot in Europe. Up to a point, Hitler agreed to that. Now, the fall of France changed all that. Uh, Churchill warned Stalin about the war, which Stalin thought meant that the British were trying to start a war between Germany and the USSR. And Sikorsky understood that the German-Soviet uh, alliance took on a completely new um, dimension compared to before. Now, one more word of comment uh, in terms of the Polish international the situation in early 40. Now, we've been focusing on Stalin, and quite rightly so. But if you look at um, the other uh, visits, the issue of Polish borders and territory to the British were of secondary importance. Halifax basically made it clear in the House of Lords that uh, Britain has not pledged itself to reconstitute the Polish eastern border, which would have been unrealistic anyway. So in late 39, early 40, the attitude to the Wells mission was that there might be peace between Britain and France and the Third Reich. That was the threat. The issue of recovering Polish eastern territories was an abstract issue at the time. Fortunately for us, Wells' mission failed. There's one more question from Elżbieta Kowalczyk to Mr. Niewierzyn. She's asking, what do you think, Professor, about the cooperation between Wyszynski and the Ochrana, the, the Tsar's secret service before the revolution. Did that impact his position in the Bolshevik party uh, in any way? Now, one more small question from me. We've heard in Professor Vogonsi's uh, presentation a negative evaluation by Bogomolov to Sikorsky. What about Sikorsky, can we say? What, what did Wyszynski think about Sikorsky? Do we have any, um, any information about that? that the way um, he was portrayed for example, um, 
an analysis of Sikorsky prepared by the Soviets before his visit. What did the Soviets, or in particular what the Deputy um, Commissar for Foreign Affairs think uh, about Stalinsky? So that would be my question to Professor Nivezhin, and then I'll ask the others um, to follow suit. It was the opinion that before the 1st of September, Poland was not informed by uh, about the secret protocol. I have encountered an opinion that that was not true, that the French informed Poland about uh, this uh, before. Professor Nivision. Thank you very much uh, for this question. I don't know any sources to document Vyshinsky's cooperation with the Ochrana, um, the, the Tsar's secret service. If we talk about uh, the topic of my presentation, it was about the period before the war as well, when we talked about Sikorsky's visit, he did meet with uh, Vyshinsky. So Vyshinsky did meet Sikorsky. And this also includes the meetings in Kuybyshev. Uh, but I can't give an exact answer on what Vyshinsky's attitude to Sikorsky was. Sikorsky went on to Moscow, and then uh, Vyshinsky did not participate in the Moscow negotiations. I think that uh, the Polish historians more know about this. I think you have uh, more detailed information about these topics. I just focused on the beginnings of the war. Now, about the, the visit by Sikorsky, and this is beyond the scope of my presentation, but uh, some in foreign intelligence documents were published, the, the Soviet foreign intelligence documents. Basically, everything that Sikorsky said, um, all his impressions were duly noted by the intelligence. So that's another interesting source of uh, information. Certainly, as uh, Mr. Dembski said at the beginning of his presentation, uh, you gave some very important information about uh, his character or, or the way uh, Vyshinsky was perceived as a sort of uh, evil uh, person because of participating in the repressions. Yes, this is correct. The realities of the Stalinist period was some people, like Vyshinsky, you know, he was a nobody at the beginning, he was a Menshevik, actually, in uh, during the Civil War. He was a Menshevik, not Bolshevik, and he did not want to join the Bolshevik party. He did not come from a uh, uh, worker's background. So who would have expected that his career would have been so great? Now, when we talk about a career in diplomacy, this is truly amazing. And we can say that his skills were quite fantastic. He was, uh, he developed in many areas. When he was in Kuybyshev, for example, he was responsible for everything. He dealt with uh, distribution, with uh, cooperation with diplomats. He uh, sold things like accommodation, food, even the distribution of alcohol was his role. When banquets were organized in Kuybyshev, it was him who would say how many bottles of wine there would be, or, or vodka, how many would be earmarked for a particular banquet. Thank you very much. 
If you could keep it brief. Right. About what Dr. Adamski said, I completely agree. I think it's an attempt to rationalize even these uh, quite amazing things. When we look at this idea of an Eastern Pact or Mutual Assistance Pact from 1935, where um, Sikorsky evaluated this pact between Moscow and Paris positively, it's a good idea to remember that Sikorsky was physically unable to say anything bad about France. He, he basically thought that France was always right. Now, what Professor Tvinka said is also uh, correct. I spoke for 30 minutes, which was more than the allocated time, but uh, I still didn't cover everything. I agree with your interpretation that the Wells' mission was there to prepare conditions for peace and that it would have been bad if uh, uh, the Polish borders were reinstated in the form of the uh, Warsaw Duchy. But I don't think that Wells was even um, considering this. Maybe the Polish foreign minister did, but not Sikorsky. Now, about Professor Voss's uh, presentation, let me add that Sikorsky was extremely optimistic about the result of his talks. Sokolnitsky's Ankara uh, diary confirms this. If we had it, if it had been published in full, we may have uh, learned more because some of these things were crossed out. In, in Cairo, Sikorsky said to him, you know, you might feel sorry about it, but I will tell you that Stalin is just like Pilsudski, but more consistent. No comments on that. And finally, you said, did the French inform us? Well, it's sort of, uh, uh, it doesn't sound very good of me to say this, but I'll say both yes and no. They received first rate information about the secret protocol being prepared, and M Minister Bonnet mentioned about it to Lukashevich, sort of between the lines. The Polish side interpreted this as pressure to let uh, the Red Army in. But on the 31st of August, these were the last hours of peace in the afternoon, and Mr. Bonnet talked to Lukashevich and said that uh, indeed the Baltic republics had been traded to the Soviets, that Germany gave them up to Germany. The Pole asked the Frenchman, do you know anything about Poland? And he said, no, I don't, which wasn't true historically because uh, the French government had very good, very reliable sources, including in Berlin, from their ambassador about it. Yes, I think uh, we're already in break time, so just a few words. When I wrote this paper, it was like squeezing a lemon. What I mean is that I think I have probably squeezed out all the sources that are available at the moment. Uh, including some uh, publications that haven't been published yet, some papers that haven't been published. Some of them were only available online. Having done that, I am unable to answer the question about Vyshinsky's attitude to Sikorsky, because I am not aware of sources about that. I would know them if Vyshinsky's diplomatic journal were available, but it's only available in uh, fragments. I don't think it was ever published in full. I have not heard about anyone being able to, full, to, to use the full copy. In a few moments, we will talk about some of the most interesting documents that Lukasz Adamski has just published. These are Bogomolov's reports that I quoted. 
and some fragments of the diplomatic journals, but we don't have access to other reports by Bogomolov, and he did write a lot of them. And I would be very happy to read something that I believe might be the most important part of the Soviet documentation for that part, which is the instructions that were sent to London, to Molot, to Maisky and Bogomolov from Moscow. Sadly, we don't know the content of those instructions. What I have shown you is something I've been able to prize out of the currently available source material, which is very fragmented. At the uh, main archive of the Russian Federation is not fully open, so I'm sorry to say that answering the questions posed by Mr. Dembski uh, will be impossible for some time to come. Thank you. This concludes the first part of our conference. Let me thank all the speakers and let us thank them with a round of applause. A very interesting presentation and a very warm very warm greetings to uh, our colleague from Moscow. I hope that the pandemic and other limitations won't prevent them uh, prevent us from meeting soon. All the best. Thank you very much. And let's now take a short break. Ten past eleven will uh, present the publication that the professor mentioned, it's the documents on Polish-Soviet relations in the Second World War. So everyone's invited, and I'll be telling you more about it in 20 minutes. Goodbye.
Tak, tak, możemy to zrobić. Zapraszam Państwa na kolejną część naszej konferencji, która będzie poświęcona prezentacji książek, tomów, dokumentów do historii stosunków polsko-sowieckich 1918-1945. Tak, Panie Profesorze. Hello, and we're beginning the second part of our presentation. And it will be quite obvious to say that without historical resources, historians would have nothing to do. And thinking about historical sources, I can remember an anecdote that is related to uh, the Soviet Union, there was a Colonel Zhilin, a famous Soviet historian, who was defending one of his academic dissertations, and he was asked by one of the reviewers whether or not he was using any foreign resources in his um, dissertation, which mean, and uh, Zhilin said, I never use uh, the resources of, uh, of the enemies. And I can reassure you that the authors of these publications have used all kinds of resources, including hostile resources. And we will spend the next 30 minutes to present the different volumes. And Mr. Marius Rose, the editor-in-chief of the series, will be kindly asked to take the floor. Yes, I can hear you and can you hear myself this time. So let me just chip in very briefly into this introduction. That I, I hope that it's only us who will be uh, benefiting from these sources, but also our readers. So now very briefly about the uh, editorial series that we're talking about here. What we're about to present to you, uh, two volumes, very on two different chronological extremes. So this is the latest volume that covers the Second World War. And uh, Łukasz Adamski, who is the, um, the editor of that particular volume, is going to present it. But this is just a, a part of a larger whole. And as the editor-in-chief of the whole series, let me tell you, this is about 6,000 pages and about 2,000 documents, the vast majority of which has never been published before. So this is issue number one. Secondly, I would like to uh, tell you about the idea behind the series. Uh, it originated here at the uh, center of uh, Polish-Russian dialogue, which is a co-organizer of the conference. And the center is also uh, the <coughs> official publisher of the series. Now, to start with, the idea was quite different. It was supposed to be a joint project by Polish and uh, Russian historians. It was the idea. We had some meetings and some decisions were made. But in latter 2014, the Russian side decided to um, back down, which took us by surprise. But looking at it from my own point of view, I consider this to be my own failure. In 2018, the Russians uh, issued a publication date of their own four volumes. They were quite uh, bulky about the Polish um, and Soviet relations in the years 1845. Uh, the late Mikhail Narinsky was the editor of the series. He was also an eminent historian. And, and this was also uh, with the collaboration of uh, other scientists. Now, it seems that uh, this was how they continued uh, the work we started, and uh, the effects are for you to judge. What makes our 
publishing series different from the Russian series is that, first of all, these are not just Polish documents. These are also Soviet diplomatic documents that were obtained from a number of archives. And they're not just uh, diplomatic documents. It's all sorts of uh, documentation of Polish and Soviet issues. Secondly, our documents pertain to military issues, to publishing issues, and many others. That was how we wanted to show this. And you can see very clearly in volume number one especially that we also talk about uh, Polish contacts with the different groups of the white Russians. Our editors include an eminent group of authors. Most of you are present here. Volume 1 was edited by Jan Jacek Bruski with my participation. Volume 2, Piotr Uszkowski from Warsaw University. He's not present here with us. And by the way, the, the second volume is about to be published. It's uh, on the home stretch in terms of uh, the finishing editing touches. And that's for 26.32. Volume 3 is being prepared by Professor Kornat, who's also present here. And that's 32.39. And volume 4, also presented today, brand new, is the Second World War. Now, the most important question, perhaps, is who is this for? Who are these volumes addressed to? Well, like we said in the, in the introduction to the second volume, we said this is to participate in the dialogue with many other publishing series. This obviously is by no means the first series on Polish-Soviet relations in the first half of the 20th century. There are a number of Russian publications published for almost all of this, uh, Polish diplomatic documents as well, which partly overlap chronologically with uh, our publications. I'm also thinking about the four volumes published by the Russians that I've shown you. And importantly, I'm also thinking about the documents that were published a long time ago uh, that were about the history of Polish-Soviet relations. They were published in the day and age of uh, a lot of pressure on historians and those white uh, gaps, as they're called, were present there. And we've been trying to uh, close those gaps. A perhaps controversial decision that we've made was to have two language versions of these documents. So we have the original, which is usually Russian, but there are also some documents in French, English, and others with a translation into Polish. Now, someone might say, why is that needed? An, an expert will be able to cope with it anyway, without a translation. But the idea of this series is to be not just for experts. These documents that we've got are to be complementary to other series that have been published in the past. We would also like for them to be used by more people, by anyone who's interested in Polish-Soviet relations in this very difficult period of uh, interbellum and uh, the war itself. And that's why we decided to have these translated by specialists, by linguists. I would like to thank them for the effort. 
sometimes the uh, the editors of these volumes also did some of the translation work, but that was more of an exception than a rule. Now, one thing that we are fully aware of is that the languages we have here, Russian, French, and German, are languages that are no longer as popular abroad as they used to be. The number of people who can read in Russian or in French is shrinking. And that's why we decided to go for this particular solution. It is up to you to decide whether it was the, the good solution. Now, uh, we carried out um, queries in a number of countries. Uh, the Russian Federation, of course, Ukraine, Polish archives, British archives, American archives. And as we looked for Polish or Soviet documents, we sometimes reached um, out to other archives as well. Now, this uh, query was not completely uh, exhaustive. As I said, we were planning to print about 2,000 documents, but you uh, know just as well as I do that we are, well, it's impossible to publish all these documents, and you need to select what you want to publish. And this is never an easy task. It also shows the degree to which different documents have been preserved. Professor Kornat talked about it as uh, a different level of production of these documents in different periods. What is meant by this is that there are more documents when a lot was happening in the Polish-Russian relations, and when it was calmer, especially in the 20s, there were, there were fewer of those documents. What is uh, noticeable, and this is something that uh, we did not manage to do because it's difficult to do those queries in Russian archives. So as a result, there are more Polish than Soviet documents represented. In their publication, the Russians only published the Soviet documents. We, on the other hand, used both Polish and Soviet documents. Now, in the first volume, it's more or less 80-20, I'd say, in terms of the proportion. And there are obviously more Polish documents. However, there were some uh, periods when we were able to obtain many more documents that are not known and that haven't been published before. Now, we've got some documents from the Soviet Union that are not included in the Soviet publication, so these do not overlap 100%. So there are periods when there are more Soviet documents than Polish, especially in, in 1925 and 6, 27. So it's not uh, ideal in terms of uh, proportions. And this is something I strove for at the beginning in a, a, a bit idealistic way. And I did want for this to be 50-50. We also managed to find and publish a lot of Polish documents that are in Russian archives, especially the Russian military archive. Uh, 308K is the department of the general staff and then the Polish army that hasn't been used that much by mm, uh, researchers before. And I thank you to Mr. Kuszewski, thanks to whom we've found a lot of Polish documents about some of the key people like, like Trobilajski or Kowalewski. He's not controversial, but he was an eminent uh, person. 
So, I think um, if you're interested in details, and not just Polish-Soviet relations, but also um, biographical issues, you will also find some interesting things here. Now, volume two is the, just about to be published in, in a few days, literally. The third, prepared by Professor Kornat, will be published in early 22, which is also quite soon. And this is how we will complete uh, this series with eight volumes, quite large, of up to 1,000 pages each. And that's going to be um, the series that we have uh, been working on very diligently for a long time. Uh, let me thank our colleagues, the ones I've mentioned before, the editors of the individual volumes for uh, absolutely brilliant work and collaboration. I myself learned a lot in the process. And I would like to thank the employees of the center who put in a lot of uh, effort in making sure that these were indeed published. Now, let me wrap up with something that you might consider a very careful statement, but uh, this is what I want to say. The late Professor Borodzi, who edited all the diplomatic uh, document series, said that even an experienced historian has to go to archives to find the original documents. So yes, you need to use archives, but maybe this publication will make it easier for you to know what to look for. Thank you very much. Valls, uh, the editor-in-chief of this series, has presented a, um, a certain uh, ins and outs of how the series was developed. Now, we have the editor of volume one, which is called Between White and Red Russia. Let's now dive deeper into this particular volume, and could you please tell us what surprised you the most? Just to add to what Professor Voz said, and, and he did say a lot about uh, the series as a whole and our volume as well. But one is uh, 1918, 26, and it's uh, in two very different parts. November 18, March 21 is one very distinct part, and it's called Poland between White and Red Russia. And this is what I would call a wartime volume, which talks about this undeclared conflict between Poland and Soviet Russia, which was starting and getting in the full swing in the springtime of 1919, but there were earlier clashes and conflicts. 11th of November 1918 is a document that's very symbolic, because that is the beginning of the Polish statehood and the beginnings of the conflict with the Soviet state. And then the Treaty of Riga is the conclusion of this period. Now, as opposed to the title of the series, this volume is not just about Polish-Soviet relations, but also about Poland in the triangle with Red Russia and many different White Russias and these different anti-Bolshevik centers. In particular, what I think is a lot of achievement on our part is that we introduced a lot of correspondence between Piłsudski and other key persons in Poland and Borysanikov and some other lesser, less known documents that talk about 
uh, Denikin and the Southern Russian government. So on the one hand, it's uh, about Poland and the Soviets, but on the other hand, the relations with different white centers. And the other volume, which you can see here on the table, is entitled Looking for a Normalization. And it's 21 as the starting date, and the end date is a bit arbitrary, 31st of May 26. Now, here, uh, the topics are quite more varied. There are different aspects here. This normalization was much more difficult after the Treaty of Riga. First of all, there are many documents that show a very different attitude of the Soviet and the Polish sides to, the, to this treaty. These issues that were very much interesting to the Soviet issues, they were interested in different things than the Poles. A review of the documents shows that what Poland was interested in, in achieving was never really achieved, which results from the certain features of the Treaty of Riga. And it was already clear in the negotiations how these weaknesses emerged, which later meant that the Treaty of Riga was uh, not to be fully implemented. And there are other aspects as well. There is a lot about the crisis of recognizing the USSR by Poland and related to the end of the turmoil on the borders. The Yampol Protocol, for example, was something that's uh, very important here. Some of the documents that are not really known and haven't been known before. So these were the first symptoms. The non-aggression pact and the other talks will only conclude in 32, but these were the beginnings. What I think is a very big advantage of this publication is documents from late 25 and early 26. As Professor Foss said, there is parity here in terms of there being a lot of Soviet documents present. And they talk about our mutual relations in the day and age of a uh, political coup in Warsaw becoming more and more possible and Marshal Piłsudski coming back to power. So we have quite considerable documentation from the Soviet side and some documents from Poland that I don't think were known before and showing the same events from the other side. So these would be the key elements, I think. The professor said that the first volume is a wartime volume. Now we have the first uh, copy of the second volume. Mr. Adamski is its editor. What were the biggest challenges when preparing uh, this document? There were two types of uh, challenges. First of all, time constraints. We started working on this project in 2012, 2013 were some of the first queries. In the meantime, a lot happened. The Russian aggression against Ukraine, which made our work in the archives much harder. Uh, the documents we were interested in were no longer made available. Twenty eighteen is a different important year. The Federal Security Service of the Russian Federation decided that I was a threat to Russian national security and defense capabilities. So I'm banned from entering Russia 
which I consider to be a certificate of uh, um, of ethics in a way, or, or moral integrity. Now, the other type of challenges were strictly scientific. I think uh, the colleagues represented here will agree that as far as the Second World War is concerned, a vast, uh, there's a very vast volume of publications. We've got the London diplomatic documents published in the 60s. We've got the Polish diplomatic documents from 39, 40, and 41. We've got a Russian series and many others. So the challenge was what else can we use to make sure that this volume includes documents that were not published before. And that's why we carried out these very detailed um, queries in the foreign policy archive of the Russian Federation. That's where we got the main body of the Russian documents. As for Polish documents, these are mostly from uh, Sikorsky Institute in London and uh, documents from um, Hoover Institute. And you can actually see them online as well. If, if you were to ask me about what new we can have, uh, we have in, in this, uh, there's a diary of the Soviet ambassador who was present in Poland in 39. And to make it clear, I received it without the right to make copies. I was assured that I would receive the permit soon. So what I did, I had to um, act as a scribe and copy it manually. So this document, which was not, it was not possible to uh, copy it officially, is now rewritten by me. And it's an interesting picture of uh, how the service perceived our diplomacy. Well, Mr. Vos mentioned uh, the report of the Soviet ambassador, uh, Mr. Bogomolov. It was his evaluation of the uh, Polish policy. And there are other documents, also from the Russian Foreign Policy Archive. For example, some documents that tell us more about the attitude of Polish communists or people perceived as Polish communists. And to my surprise, Oskar Lange was a Polish economist who worked in Chicago, who had American citizenship, but he is believed to be a Soviet agent. And he returned to Poland after the war. He would meet Stalin and Molotov in, um, during the war. And in November 44, he wrote a very large memo saying why it's in the interest of Poland and the Soviet Union to leave Lvov as part of Poland. His arguments, in my opinion, are more valid than the arguments of the Polish government at the time. His arguments were more uh, pertinent. And Lange was uh, treated very harshly by Molotov. His, his reply is basically impolite. Now, about the Polish documents. I wanted them to be uh, documents that haven't been published before. And also, if someone is interested in uh, the exact content of the sikorsky maisky mm, agreement, they shouldn't be forced to look elsewhere. I also wanted for them to show the Polish legal position 
and the international position in terms of international law. I also tried to, pub to include documents that would show us the atmosphere around the decision makers and what happened in the background. For example, the emotions that were there. Uh, there were some children's letters, uh, letters sent by children from the USSR to uh, Sikorsky and other ministers. There are documents that show how Poland <coughs> tried to fight for the um, rights of the Polish Orthodox Church in the relationship with the Soviet Union, which is very interesting in the context of the Ukrainian um, Orthodox Church, which is not recognized by Moscow. Uh, there were details of the talks with the um, uh, bishops in Russia and others. There's an, um, there's an, uh, an, an analysis of Yalta in the light of international law. And that's interesting because Yalta was basically when the Allied guarantees were withdrawn and Poland was basically left to its own devices and to, to cope with Stalin. That's the Polish uh, view, very common here in Poland. But the fact that the Allies ignored the existence of the head of the Polish state, the president, that's something that historians don't normally um, rec recognize or emphasize. And there are some trivia as well. For example, the fact that the word Radziecki was not imposed by the communists. On the contrary, it was uh, used in the 40s, but earlier uh, it was used in the 30s and it was being promoted by Ambassador Kot to emphasize this uh, new opening, uh, this attempt at resetting the relations. And that uh, Sikorsky's attitude to Russia and the USSR is different from the previous government. So not Sovietsky, but Radziecki. And for example, the instruction that the naming was difficult, so we should be talking not about uh, releasing these territories from the, the Soviets, but uh, freeing them from the Germans. Now, I don't want to dwell on the whole volume. It should be available in bookstores in about three weeks. Let me just read a passage from it to encourage you to buy it. This is a letter of the ambassador in Moscow to the foreign minister about uh, Polish diplomats uh, being drugged. Quote, to get my brave uh, uh, colleagues, uh, we had this following situation. Beer was served in the hotel, and it was enough to drink half a glass, and I fell to the, gr to the ground, and I th slept for 36 hours non-stop. The same happened to three of my colleagues, but the fourth one was not eating with us and arrived in time. And he took care of us, and that's why our ciphers were not disclosed. On the third day, the Soviet police betrayed the fact that uh, they knew about it. Now, I'm not disclosing this officially because this information might be useful in the future. Anyway, my respect for Russian beer has grown. That's 1943. Thank you. Very interesting anecdote. Talking about Yalta, I remember something as big as Brzezinski wrote in Foreign Affairs in 85, I think. He said, Yalta is unfinished business and it's about a provision in uh, from Yalta about having a democratic election in Poland, which did not come to pass. And moving to Professor Kornat, the most myster mysterious of those volumes, because we haven't seen it yet. Can you tell us something about that volume? Yes, very briefly, if you allow me. 
just a couple of words. Uh, I'd like to uh, strengthen the record. The communist did uh, impose the uh, Radziecki adjective in Polish, but it wasn't certainly their invention because it was it had been in use in the 30s. As for my publication, my volume, it will probably be the uh, most voluminous one. 785 documents quoted, some of them very short, that's true. As for their nature, well, I assume most of you ladies and gentlemen know that uh, Polish diplomatic documents uh, edited by Professor Borodziej, uh, also I myself was one of uh, the editors of the Polish diplomatic documents uh, volumes year 1938, they uh, brought about a large number of Polish diplomatic documents. So there is a lot of republication, a lot of repetition. Can you edit such a volume without the note uh, from the Polish to the Soviet government from the 23rd September 1938, where the Soviets uh, warned the Poles that the uh, non-aggression pact from 1936 uh, will be revoked should Czechoslovakia be attacked. These republication has uh, been uh, delivered about 30 times, but you just can't ignore it, this kind of document. The professor has already said that Notwithstanding our plans and uh, the retirement of the, the Russian side to co-edit, they are publishing a large number of uh, Russian material on their own in the third volume of, uh, uh, of their own publication. This is why my volume, my edition has this nature, that it uh, um, publishes relatively a little of the original Russian material, less than uh, from other sources, whereas uh, from the Polish side we've got lots of, lots of republication from Polish editions. Because, as you well know, the 30s are very rich in events. In 1933, starts a uh, never, never-ending uh, international crisis that comes to an end on the 1st September 1939. Due to this historical acceleration, the historians were very much interested in this particular period. As you are probably aware, a large part of Polish uh, material is uh, of bilateral nature and requires no justification. But I have uh, included a lot of documents on the internal situation of the Soviet Union, including things that may raise some eyebrows that there are German-Soviet talks going on in 1939, while the uh, Ambassador Grzybowski analyzes tractors and uh, production of other devices in the country. But this is telling. Such an example is telling, right? The Marshal Piłsudski also ordered his uh, collaborators to research the internal matters as well due to be able to uh, evaluate the situation. The third uh, eyebrow raising matter, the, and these are non-edited articles, that the document are not, uh, that a document may not refer directly to Polish-Soviet relations, but may be an analysis of our own, of directions of our own foreign policy with the Soviet Union in mind. In mind. For example, in 1938, Mr. Szembek sent a uh, letter to the Polish ambassador in Tokyo, Mr. Romer, about four pages of normalized text. Uh, it's a rather large letter, given the diplomatic standards. 
and there are, there's only but half page about Polish-Soviet relations, but it's a key fragment because it's a fragment on a key moment in the relations. Enough for the examples. These are my three cents on the nature of this volume. We're indexing currently the the volume, but it's uh, it hasn't been uh, maqueted yet. Thank you very much, uh, Professor. Thank you very much, editors, the series, and we shall move on to the next panel. Magdalena Huas, PhD. Tadeusz Paweł Rutkowski and uh, Professor Jacek Tabinka will join us in the next panel, please. We shall begin with a speech that I think uh, rhymes with Sikorsky's visit in uh, Moscow in December 1941. And then we'll move on to something that the journalists are not very fond of when historians speak about it. And I'm guessing here, looking at the titles of the speeches. So we shall speak about what we don't know and what we would like to know. So it opens up some space for speculations and and uh, demonstrations of imagination. We shall also speak about something that's very important for every historian, every diplomat, namely how to conduct policy by words, how to convince partners, and how to do it internationally. This will be discussed by uh, Mr. Adamski. So all in all, it will be a very attractive lecture that certainly rhymes with uh, today's russian ukrainian conflict. All of our panelists are here. Magdalena Huas, PhD with the Institute of Polish Academy of Sciences, will speak about the Anthony Edens and Sosikorsky's visit in Moscow in December. So the uh, subject of my lecture, the visits of Eden and Sikorsky, it's actually Sikorsky's visit that went first, and then Eden's. It's not irrelevant because Sikorsky came to Moscow when the uh, Russian counteroffensive uh, had not started, and it did have uh, an impact on the quality of the talks. These two visits uh, have been researched thoroughly already. And don't worry, I'm not going to discuss again the visits as such, uh, their course and their consequences. I was interested in another problem. I regarded the two visits as a failed, to be honest, attempt at common allied action, Polish-British. Also, it was an attempt at uh, uh, scoring against the Soviet Union. I'm very happy that uh, Professor Vos spoke before me. Also, it could because my uh, command of Soviet sources is insufficient, while Professor Voos uh, is an expert, which in turn allows us to have a more complete picture. I focus on the Polish and British parts, and I'd like to focus on one main thing at the very beginning. In general, I'll focus on the discrepancies between the two allies, that is Poland and uh, the United Kingdom, rather than uh, on the common points or common actions. Such common actions had been uh, envisaged before, before the meeting of uh, Sikorsky and Eden. There were talks on synchronizing the two um, the visits of these two politicians to Moscow. 
the concept not only failed later, but uh, actually um, led to a pretty uh, reverse situation. The supply conference in uh, September, October, with Giverbrook uh, sent by the British and Hovermack from sent by the Americans participated, and uh, that conference gave birth to that visit because for the Brits it was important that during the supply conference Stalin um, proposed the Brits an agreement for the post-war period for the first time. An agreement uh, on cooperation had been signed back in August already, but this time the matter uh, was about a post-war agreement. Beaverbrook did not react to that proposal. Cripps, the uh, British ambassador in Moscow, could not believe it. Uh, he was uh, actually not informed about this outcome. And uh, he did debate, uh, debate that uh, later on with Eden. And that debate took place. Uh, it was uh, presented to the war cabinet. And it was said that it was inadmissible. It had been inadmissible to refuse such a proposal. Cripps, during the uh, during Eden's visit, was uh, an important player during the talks. Cripps was pushing for the agreement to be signed with the Soviet Union. And uh, he was also the author of the memorandum for from October 1940, which actually formed uh, sort of a base for such an agreement. On the Polish hand, so to speak, the Moscow conference was a uh, supply conference was uh, in evaluated differently. It was a failure for Poles. Beaverbrook had promised to protect Polish interests during the conference and he did not do so. All the supplies that were supposed to go to Poland, they were not sent directly to Poland, but, but via Soviet Union, Poland was supposed to receive them. When Sikorsky realized the Polish defeat at the conference, he uh, appreciated from then on the uh, direct relations, direct talks with Stalin, which was yet another motivator next to uh, the visits to Polish uh, troops and uh, the Soviet Union. For the United Kingdom to sign the agreement was the, the post-war agreement was the main goal, was a big issue also to uh, take down Stalin's uh, lack of trust. And for the Poles, it was more important to actually enforce the treaty signed in that had been signed in um, July 1941 on releasing Polish prisoners from the Gulag and uh, on forming the troops. Next to Sikorsky's and Eden's visits, uh, one needs to take into account other actors, even though they may have been very much background figures. The, a Polish example of such an actor was the Polish political opposition, very much opposed to the Sikorsky-Majski agreement. Sikorsky, via his actions, even though I don't have hard evidence for that, so Sikorsky, in his actions, had targeting Poles was trying to convince that the Sikorsky Maski agreement had been uh, necessary, even though it did not secure the eastern border of Poland. On the British side, Cripps was an important player. 
plus the United States, that the United Kingdom often referred to as in for the sake of consultation, uh, for the reason of Roosevelt's Atlantic uh, Charter and uh, British uh, dominions. The Brits were obliged to consult their dominions, and they did stick to that principle. Particularly, the Australian Prime Minister was interested and important because he felt the Pacific threat incoming, and uh, he was uh, very much in favor of an agreement with the Soviet Union so that uh, they could be uh, persuaded to engage in the Far East. Apart from that, and Cripps uh, did mention it, the Brits uh, had to take into account uh, the public opinion and political opinion components that opposed the alliance with this is the Soviet Union. I wanted to also uh, underline two more things apart, apart from the trips themselves. The Sikorsky's declaration from the 4th of December mentioned the post-war period as well, which was the uh, of, of utmost importance for the for the British. Cripps, in his um, diary that is stored at the Bodleian Library, at least that's where I had access to it, Gabriel Gorodetsky published lots of uh, content of uh, Cripps' diary. Crips on the 4th uh, December, so right after the signing of the declaration that he learned about from Sikorsky himself, he complained that that declaration had been signed first, uh, earlier than any British agreement with the Soviet Union. He considered the United Kingdom that the United Kingdom should have uh, been the role model for everyone else. And he was probably right, because Sikorsky on 17 uh, December, writing to Churchill about his Kremlin visit, he boasted that the Turkish representatives and others thanked him for the declaration and principally for the promise of the Soviet Union not to interfere with the internal matters of other states. So for me, it was very, uh, it was a very relevant information that uh, Professor Volos mentioned. Uh, the question of Zdenek Ferdinger, uh, whether because he asked whether Poles, the Poles, was going were going to sign any kind of agreement with the Soviet Union. So I think the declaration matter is relevant in Polish-British um, relations. The third party, notwithstanding here, Sikorsky in his talks with Cripps demonstrated his satisfaction with the meeting with Stalin. That satisfaction was caused to a large extent by the fact that it all referred to the military. Sikorsky, on his way to Moscow, 
had already had arrangements with uh, Churchill that he uh, was going to evacuate his troops from the Soviet Union. During the talks with Stalin, he uh, dropped that idea. There was one. Uh, there were details left to discuss with Stalin, such as uh, the uh, numerosity of troops. But my main question is why was Sikorsky why Sikorsky was satisfied? Because it allowed him to show Stalin that Sikorsky was independent from the United Kingdom. I very much liked how uh, the professor uh, worded that. Uh, he was able to show that he wasn't a a poster uh, ally and that he was going to conduct his own policy regardless of uh, Churchill's, regardless of the arrangements made of Churchill. He also mentioned in the letter that um, the change of arrangements during the conference impressed Stalin because he had been convinced that uh, we were just a tool in the hands of the United Kingdom. I've got three minutes left, so I would like to discuss yet another matter that I think is uh, particularly le relevant, and I wasn't able to solve it completely, but I can share my doubts with you. On the 3rd and 4th December, during the talks with Tal Stalin, uh, Sikorsky announced yet another meeting with Stalin. He was supposed to come back from Kuybyshev to Moscow, and then from Moscow back to Kuybyshev uh, to visit uh, and inspect the troops, and again return to Moscow for yet another talks, and this time mention the borders. Stalin, uh, well, Sikorsky himself started with the nationality, citizenship uh, problems uh, on the 3rd of December. And while citizenship could be dealt with, that there could have been exchanges and concessions, whilst while this was up for negotiation, then the borders uh, were negotiable. And he announced his uh, another visit to Moscow, but that did not happen. Even though it had been discussed and the talks had been scheduled, Stalin, until uh, the very end, uh, was of the opinion that uh, he could uh, host Sikorsky on Kremlin once again. Sikorsky uh, was reportedly ill, but uh, Cripps in his diary mentions that it was their agreement that Sikorsky would not visit Moscow again. I have not found any other trace of such a strong British influence over Sikorsky in this particular matter. I think this uh, requires further research because it was a relevant matter due to its consequences. Now, Cripps uh, cared for two things, not only for Sikorsky not to meet Stalin, but also for Sikorsky not to meet Eden. So the attempts at uh, uh, discussing the details of the common visit of Eden and Sikorsky ended up with a very clear uh, evasion of any common joint meetings. The question is whether it was because Sikorsky was an obstacle for a uh, for a possible British-Soviet uh, agreement. I'm not sure. Maybe some of you, ladies and gentlemen, have, will have any idea. Uh, but this is where I will put a full stop. Thank you very much, uh, Doctor. Dr. Magdalena Huas spoke to you. She tried to uh, show how the two orchestras, the Polish one and the British one, uh, began to play different tunes in front of Stalin and the Soviets. 
uh, we can see now how some British ambitions uh, made themselves clear because Cripps thought that it should have been a model first. The British agreement should have been a model for others. That was pure ambition. Uh, so political ambition uh, was made clear by Cripps. Now uh, I'd like to give the floor to Mr. Tadeusz Rudkowski, who will speak about the historiography 1941-1942 on uh, what uh, we'd like to know but we don't know as of yet. Ladies and gentlemen, I've, I've came back to some of the documents and, and publications I read uh, many years ago about what we do know and what we don't know about the relations and the diplomacy between Poland and Soviet Russia. Two important events are at the beginning and the end of this period that we are talking about. Sikorsky's visit to Moscow that I'm not going to talk about anymore and its direct consequences and then 42 when Soviet policy towards Poland is becoming more defined. So th that's a year when a lot happened and it has a, um, a train of events that were all equally important. And this is something that has been written about in, in Polish historiography since the 50s. So I would like to focus on the last 20 or 30 years in terms of the historical writing about that period. What we know, what interpretations dominate in this discourse. The issues that were researched and that were the foundation of that period was all about the implementation of the decisions made during Sikorsky's visits. Uh, the movement of the Polish troops to the south, organizing uh, provisions for the civilian population and the uh, memo on citizenship. That's something that the Polish and Soviet diplomacy were very much involved in in 1942. And the first evacuation of the army, very important politically, perhaps even more than militarily. The first evacuation, and then the preparations with an important role of the UK about the second evacuation. And finally, the liquidation of the branches of the embassy and then uh, the rest of the diplomacy was more ritual because there was no chance or no likelihood of any breakthrough. And this is what I would like to refer to in my presentation. Uh, I'll do it in a nutshell. This is not going to be an in-depth analysis of the Polish historiography. And there are a lot of publications that are about this, both synthetic and individual. And the first issue I would like to raise Mm -hmm. 
in Poland, the first publications are in the 70s. There was the biography of Sikorsky. And then 1981 was another publication about it. And another book by Piotr Żaroń, which was uh, rightly criticized. And these are some of the fundamental books for the knowledge that we have about those relationships. And the other books that I mentioned that contain documents on these Polish-Soviet relations with documents published in the mid-50s by Stanislav Kot and others. And to a large extent, Polish documents were used and uh, British to a lesser extent. And that starts to change after the 1950s when research by Tybinka into British policy began and when Soviet documents were made available. Even though we still have some problems with them not being complete. Hopefully, uh, the wartime volume of this series will extend our uh, knowledge about it, although it has to be said that due to the attitude in Russia towards this sort of studies, this will certainly not be a complete picture. I would like to talk first and foremost about the books by Matelski in the history of Polish diplomacy and also published as a book on the Polish-Soviet relations in the years 1918-1943. Then we have a book by Zbigniew Szymaszko about uh, the Soviet Union, Jacek Śluk Sarczyk, whose book was published in the 80s, then uh, revised in the 90s. Piotr Żaroń, also published in the 1990s and early 2000. Then we have Raczynski's uh, The Political History of Poland, uh, and it's also by uh, Wieczorkiewicz. In the light of my own research and reading, what strikes me is that in many aspects, these books are quite superficial in their analysis of the relations between Poland and the Soviet Union. And I focus on the Soviet side of things. As I looked at those publications, what strikes me as important is a line of thought that goes back to the uh, socialist Poland uh, history writing. I, I can see it clearly in Materski and Graczynski, which comes as no surprise if you know their biography, where the main topic is the assumption of Stalin's goodwill. 
the assumption that uh, the Soviets were open towards Poland and that Poland had a lot to say. Now, this can be seen pretty clearly. For example, when there was the idea of the Soviets to send the 5th Polish Infantry Division to the front, apparently what the Soviets wanted was to show the participation of the Polish army in the uh, war effort, among other things. And apparently Stalin was opposed to the deployment of that division. What I think is that uh, he did want for some units of the Polish army to be sent to the front in order for them to be destroyed. Now, the 100,000 limit was set by Sikorsky. That is in line with what Matersky said, but a single division wouldn't really make a difference. So this interpretation seems quite naive to me. Later I'm going to quote some other interpretations that show that this uh, conviction that one could come to terms with Stalin but Poles didn't do it is very clear in Materski and especially in Turaczyński. Now, about what we do not know from these analyses is the long-term strategy of the Soviets towards Poland. The question is, did one exist? Was anything planned long-term, or was it just uh, in terms of reacting to the current developments. I am of the opinion that some activities were planned by the Soviets in a time frame of about one year ahead. Now, this is not something we're sure of, but this is something we can guess. And all this becomes even more important in the light of Stalin's 18th of March meeting, where this activity is assessed critically by Materski. He said that Anders broke the principles of uh, diplomacy, which is interesting. And Vitorkevich writes about it when he says, in his memoirs, he was thinking about the reasons for Stalin's decision and willingness to carry out his plan. The works I've analyzed don't include an in-depth analysis of Sikorsky's Eastern policy. Kalbarczyk and Jacek Tebinka in, in the work, um, in the later work, uh, we can see that they are more and more critical of this foreign policy. Probably because Sikonski's policy was very reactive and it assumed uh, or hoped for too much of British support. 
I'm refraining from my own opinion about it. It's just what follows from these publications. Especially when we talk about the decision about the first evacuation, these interpretations were pre first presented by Anders in his memoirs. When no criticism of Anders' decision was made, and his decision was not agreed upon with the Polish diplomacy beforehand. Now, other interpretations that are better known these days is the issue of the role of the British during the second evacuation and the question of whether we th this three core army should be left in the USSR, which Sikorsky wanted, or whether they, this army should be withdrawn to the British territories. Matelski and Duraczynski emphasized the role of the British. And later research shows that the British didn't play an active role in the evacuation of all of the troops, but they were interested in shifting some of them to the Middle East. Now, the reasons for the deterioration of the Polish-Soviet relations after the first evacuation, and Matelski says, that not much happened and uh, this deterioration wasn't um, overnight. And this also sounds a bit naive to me. Matelski also accuses the Polish side of generating these conflicts through its spying activities. Now, Any information about the Soviet Union, Union was considered um, espionage by the Soviets, but I found, for example, photographs of Soviet air, um, uh, airstrips and military um, installations. So the fact is, that these issues, that the espionage did happen, and it was also used by the Soviet side and uh, accusing the Polish side for it isn't quite reasonable. Now, let me now move on to what we do not know or what we don't know enough about. After new documents were disclosed, We move to what remains the basis of uh, our work to this day. There are namely three groups. Well, the first is the assumption of the goodwill of Stalin, at least at, up to a point, and uh, the feasibility of Sikorsky's policy. The second approach is that uh, Anders was right, and it's very strong in our immigration history writing. And this is and the third part is critical 
vis-à-vis uh, -vis the effects of Sikorsky's policy, and that's Vyotorkiewicz and Materski to some extent, but not uh, Jacek Tabinka. We don't know what Stalin thought about uh, uh, the emigre government after December 1941, what was the attitude of the Soviet authorities to the fact that the Polish army was established in the Soviet Union, to what extent the idea was to use it on the front and to exterminate it, or maybe uh, it was hoped that uh, some of the officer corps would become um, favorably disposed towards the Soviets. We don't know when the decision was made by the Soviets to um, evacuate the Polish army from the Soviet Union and whether it was done on Anders's initiative and whether it uh, was as a result of what the British needed. Now, this also ties in with the liquidation of the uh, representation of the Polish embassy. So a lot of this is based on indirect sources, a lot of the information we have about when the Soviet decision was made to build an alternative to the legitimate Polish government. This was pretty clear in late 1942, or at least early 1943. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Rutkowski. Has given us, um, in a nutshell, a synthesis of the Polish Soviet relations. And he also asks some questions that I think are a good lead into our discussion. But before that, we have two more panelists. So the question I've written down is whether there was a long term strategy in relation to Poland um, at the Kremlin. How do we evaluate Sikorsky's Eastern policy and also whether it was possible to strike a deal with Stalin? Before I move on to questions, I would first like to ask Professor Tebinka from the Political Studies Institute at Gdańsk University. It's about Stalin, United Kingdom and Poland, and the title of the presentation is Questions Without Answers. Uh, thank you for inviting me to the conference. I hope you can hear me. And it's a pleasure to be here. Due to time constraints, I'll have to be jumping around between 1939 and 45. But we have experts here and people who understand the relations between Poland and the Soviet Union in that period. So some things may be hinted at without dwelling on detail too much. Although I will try to use some quotations to illustrate some of the um, way of thinking, especially in the case of Stalin. Now, my first question. Uh, some of them are questions that even uh, Russian historians can't answer, as I think, if or when they get full access to whatever is left of the Soviet documents, not just from the foreign ministry, but in general. So the first question that it's a good idea to ask about, without trying to overinterpret it, is 
the issue of what would have stopped Stalin from invading Poland in September 39. Well, here we are in a better situation because without Russian sources we can show that the Russian Japanese uh, armistice and uh, the completion of the fighting in Manchuria and Mongolia was a key element that uh, translated into the attack on the 17th of September, which, by the way, the Soviet army was not prepared for. A more strict reactions, especially from France uh, on land, militarily, may have impacted Stalin's opinion. He was afraid of the Western powers. He overestimated their strength, and this is quite clear towards the end of the Winter War. Where, when the threat of an intervention by an interventionary corps uh, of the Allies probably resulted in Finland, which in March of 1940 was pretty much beaten, it managed to negotiate conditions that it gave its independence or preserved its independence, albeit with territorial losses. Between the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact and the 21st of uh, June 1941, Stalin was very much for the cooperation with the Germans. Any British initiative, initiatives, something like that, what Dr. Huas wrote about in her interesting and innovative memorandum about uh, the Cribs memorandum about the, the proposals for British concessions and that that was uh, destined to be a failure and it also made Stalin convinced that uh, Churchill is driving at um, causing a rift between Berlin and Moscow, which Stalin was right about, but he also uh, forgot that his own position internationally changed very much after the fall of France. The Nazi attack on the Soviet Union changed the situation significantly. After the US joined the war, the situation will change, but before that, Britain only had a limited possibility of helping the Soviet Union, but that didn't make Stalin any less suspicious of Britain. On the contrary, from the point of view of the Soviet Union, ever since the revolution uh, in, in 1917, the UK was the main enemy, even if the UK was a democratic country and, the, and Nazi Germany was a totalitarian, but that didn't change how Stalin perceived them. Between 41 and 43, Stalin kept demanding opening up a second front in Western Europe, ignoring the obvious uh, military impossibility of doing that. That would have been suicidal. He also overlooked the fact that even if the scale of involvement on land was smaller in the Western Allies than in the Soviet Union, but the Allied activities helped the Soviet Union very much. Some obvious items that are worth reminding down by the Allies in the West and the USSR in 42. We've got El Alamein, and Operation Torch, the landings in North Africa, and then a little bit later, uh, Stalingrad in 43, Kursk, and the uh, Sicily landings, 44, June. 
At that point, uh, the Axis have lost the war, but then that's when we got D-Day and Bagration. So Stalin's suspicions are a very key element of his attitude to the British. As Professor Rutkowski mentioned, Poles were often uh, treated as British agents, uh, for better or for worse. Uh, Professor Wawos uh, reminds us of this. But in 39, Poland was perceived as a fascist country. Let's also remember Stalin's word from 39 uh, that he said, one fascist country less after Poland fell to the German Wehrmacht and then was finished off by the Red Army. Now, the negotiations Vont three, the participation of uh, the British leading up to the sikonsky maisky um, agreement. So was there more British pressure? And if, if there had been more British pressure, would have Stalin yielded and agreed to the demands about the eastern border? I personally don't think so. For obvious reasons, I can't prove this with full documentation documentation from the Soviet sources. Now, Sikorsky's visit to Moscow that Dr. Hu has discussed, we do have a Soviet document here that shows that Moscow was prepared to offer more in terms of the border between Poland and the Soviet Union than they offered to the Polish communists in the summer of 1944. To be fair, let's just emphasize that they also did manage to negotiate a little bit more. Now, before Eden's visit, the People's Commissariat drafted a memorandum about a possible change of the borders. Białystok, Vilnius would go to Poland and Lvov to the USSR, to the USSR, all the other way around. But I don't have detailed data on any further details. So if uh, Sikorsky's talks with Stalin happened, an agreement wouldn't have been reached. Sikorsky, for different reasons, was wasn't going to negotiate the issue of the Polish-Soviet border. But even if we assumed that an agreement of that could have been reached, the question is, would it have survived the Soviet military successes in Eastern and Central Europe in 44 and 45? Uh, Transcarpathian Russia or Ruthenia was also uh, a good case when suddenly uh, Russian nationals appeared there demanding that that part of Czechoslovakia uh, should be joined uh, combined with the uh, Ukrainian Soviet Republic. So an interesting question is, what were the intents of Moscow when uh, they demanded that the 5th Infantry de decision should be sent to the front in February 43? Without understanding the Russian materials, any answers are just pure speculation. Did they want to decimate or exterminate this decision? I don't think so. But the nature of the warfare on the Eastern Front meant the losses would have been large. Let's not forget about the second Polish army in 45 and its losses in the Berlin operation. Or the first division at Lenino, which after two days had to be withdrawn from the front because it was about to be completely routed. Now, in February 42, the impact of the Soviet counter-offensives 
uh, ended. But we're still very optimistic that the fate of the war could be turned quickly. So this idea for us to be fighting with them wasn't given to us when the Russians had their biggest failures, but later. About 42, and the springtime, the second evacuation of Anders's army, I changed my opinions somewhat. In my recent writing, I emphasize that, well, I basically I learned more from archives, so uh, having seen some Soviet documents, I can see very clearly that the second evacuation was a very apt step of the Soviets in response to the British. They said, if you want it for the rest of the army to be evacuated, we are going to do it. And here we come back to the questions asked uh, during socialist Poland, whether if the army stayed in the USSR and if they fought on the Eastern Front, would it have changed changed anything in the polish soviet relations. It's a long debate. I don't want to speculate on that. Coming back to Stalin, in, in his opinion on the relationship with the British in October 42, October 42, which is a critical moment for the USSR, the German offensive in the Caucasus, and Stalingrad is about to fall. Stalin writes to Maisky, saying, there's this impression here that Churchill is playing for the failure of the USSR to then have a deal with Hitler's Germany at the expense of our country. And of course, this, these suspicions on the part of Stalin, or indeed his desperation in moments of failure, resulted from different reasons. Maisky tried to explain that the UK at this particular point in history has no interest in leading to USSR failing because that would open Hitler's uh, way to Africa and to Asia and that would spell uh, the end of the British Empire. And in uh, late October Stalin replied, we'll have to wait and see. No, I, I'm not going to quote it in Russian because my horrible accent in Russian, but we all know what it, uh, if you know Russian you know how this translates and it sounds, it's, it's got a nice ring to it in Russian. And anyway, in the summer of next year, Maisky returned to Moscow, so, he didn't, so Stalin didn't quite believe it. So the question is, when did Moscow become convinced that there was no point wasting their time on the Sikorsky government, still before Katyn. Uh, Roma's uh, conversation in, uh, on the 26th and 7th of February with Stalin in the Kremlin, it seems that the atmosphere of this conversation was very good, and it seems that the two gentlemen were wasting time discussing things that were the least important. There's the statement by Stalin, and I quote, Ambassador, after destroying the Germans in the Soviet lands, this Red Army will come into Poland and will help expel Germans from there, and then it will immediately revert those lands to the Polish government, and then you will say that it's a unilateral act that destroys our mutual relations. And the ambassador replied, no, it's not going to be that bad. Ambassador, we want a strong Poland. We will give you all of the Poland occupied by Germany, 
which didn't mean uh, the Riga Treaty border in the east. For Stalin, it was Poland to the west of the ribbentrop molotov line. And there are uh, complaints by Stalin that the Poles accuse him of different things. Mind you, this is before Katyn was revealed. Now, I'm not saying he had a long-term plan at the time. The question is, would there be any far-reaching concessions concerning the border, the shape of the border, and whether it would be possible to get any better results and possibly preserving the independence of Poland? It is clear, it was clear to Stalin, that a friendly Polish government would have had included Polish communists and other fellow travelers, as the British called it. Now, I would like to jump to another topic now. Uh, Dr. Adamski prevented me from talking about it more. And this is about the uh, Lvov issue. Now, the question is, if, as the British had assumed before Tehran conference in the autumn of 43, tried to ensure that in return for Vilnius, Poland would have kept Lvov. So if uh, Churchill and Roosevelt acted more decisively, uh, would that uh, have succeeded? And it was Roosevelt who mentioned this issue. And Stalin said that those Ukrainians are exerting so much pressure, and absolutely, and there's no way that Lvov would have been given back because he treated it as part of the USSR. Now, one more thing that is worth emphasizing. The years 43, starting from the summer 44, the Polish National Liberation uh, Committee was established, and the question of the Polish government in exile returning was not discussed, given the scale of the Soviet victories that was already impossible. Now, we know something about Stalin's thoughts uh, from what the Polish communists wrote. In autumn 44, he was even ready to agree for Mikołajczyk becoming head of this new government, but obviously he would have surrounded Mikołajczyk with communists. So this question remains open. A certain trend is visible. Surely, over time, Mikołajczyk and his allies would have been losing uh, power gradually. So the concessions that um, the USSR would have allowed in Yalta remain open question. Not in terms of territory in that particular geopolitical situation. Uh, the question of territory uh, was uh, an open and shut case. And finally, one more thing, which is at the moment in May 45, when this idea of Churchill that Poland yield some territory in return for concessions from Moscow ended in a fiasco. But that's the moment when Churchill orders the chiefs of staff to prepare well, to, to look into the idea of uh, the feasibility of liberating at least part of Poland with the use of the British, American, and Polish armies, and possibly 
some sort of a second version of the Wehrmacht rearmed. Now the, the chiefs of staff were terrified by this idea. They prepared a note that was made available a few years ago saying that the chances of this succeeding were quite small. And perhaps some of our Russian colleagues can explain more to us, but after all that, suddenly uh, the Russians said that the Soviet intelligence knew about unthinkable, the, the British plan, and that apparently uh, appropriate military deployments were made in eastern Germany. Now, it sounds quite far-fetched that any of the uh, Cambridge Ring had access to those documents. Uh, the chiefs of staff did it in their own group. Only a few officers knew about it. There were no Soviet agents among them. But even if we assume, and even if we believe that someone had heard about it and passed this information on to Moscow, that would have made Stalin even more suspicious of the West. And as we look at how the Polish issue developed in these British-American-Soviet negotiations in 44 and 45, the issue of the temporary national unity government and so forth. Now, it's difficult to connect all that with this uh, supposedly great intelligence success. Any preparations for a war with the Soviet Union were very far away from what the bulk of the politicians in Britain was hoping for. Thank you, Professor. You have uh, given us a list of interesting topics and questions. About Stalin being suspicious of the UK, I go back to 41, 42, and Sergei Eisenstein, he was finally wanted to, to start shooting um, Ivan the Terrible, and he wrote to Stalin suggesting um, that they restart the shooting and to show that uh, Ivan the Terrible liked England and his connections with uh, the British court. And Stalin's conversation with Eisenstein later after the war is very interesting when he said that his Ivan's kisses with his first wife were too passionate and the people didn't kiss like that in the 16th century. Now, Dr. Adamski will um, talk about the so-called Ukrainian argument as an element of uh, the Polish diplomacy and against the USSR. Both previous speakers have asked many interesting questions. I understand that the audience would like to hear some answers to them. Now, if any time is left, then I'll be happy to answer some of these questions if we do have the time. Uh, some of the sources that we have confirm uh, the line of thought that Professor Tebinka uh, represents. Now, in my presentation, I would like to focus on an analysis of the arguments presented by the Polish and the Soviet sides concerning the territorial dispute or territorial demands of the Soviet Union uh, concerning the Polish territory. And that's the main um, item of discontent. And I'm going to describe how these arguments changed over the years and also what was not discussed. 
there are some items that it would seem logical to um, to talk about, but they were not talked about. Now the Soviet side mentioned the humanitarian intervention at the beginning, and the well known and that of Molotov to Grzybowski, saying that the Soviet government cannot remain indifferent to the same blood of the Ukrainians and Belarusians being left to their own devices without any support. This argument was abandoned very quickly, and it was not uh, used, which makes Stalin different from Putin, who likes to use this argument, and also the historical policy of a late Soviet Union. Another argument was used very much, on the other hand, and that also related to international law, namely uh, the right of the Ukrainians to self-determination and uh, for the Ukrainians to live as part of a single state, which the Poles refused them. And that argument was regularly repeated in all the conversations with allied governments, including Polish. It was first used before the 17th of uh, September in Zhdanov's article, who was the main party ideologist, published in the Pravda, that talked about the reasons why Poland was failing in the war. The well-known quotation of Stalin in his talks with Mikołajczyk and Churchill, when Mikołajczyk said that Poles will never understand the loss of Lvov. And he said, but one and a half million Ukrainians are fighting for these lands in the ranks of the Red Army. And Ukrainians have suffered a lot uh, from Poland. Mr. Mikołajczyk would like to grab that land, which shows that he is an imperialist. So this illustrates these arguments. Another interesting argument was that in uh, 42 or late 41 that the Soviet government cannot change the borders because it doesn't have the mandate. It has to abide by the Constitution and only the Supreme Council of the USSR can change the Constitution. An interesting conversation can be quoted of a Soviet diplomat with a Polish diplomat in uh, the, the deputy of uh, Raczynski. He tried to prove that the Polish-Soviet agreement only deleted, only crossed out the Soviet-German agreement from 1939, but it didn't talk about their borders. And until this is decided after the war, the Constitution was binding, which can only be changed by the Supreme Council. So until the new uh, resolution of the Supreme Council is made, all the lands uh, taken by the USSR are Soviet. And that's why in uh, Air um, uh, they had to keep mentioning Lvov. Starting from 43, the Polish policy towards the Ukrainian minority was emphasized. That was also quoted in 39. I mentioned Stanov, and that was the 31st of August uh, speech of Molotov. But in the later years, due to diplomatic reasons, that was not raised as an issue. But starting from early 43, and the crisis in the Polish Soviet relationship uh, that uh, related to the fact of the Soviet Union said that, uh, that all Poles in the USSR will be considered Soviet citizens after 17th of uh, September. So that was a big crisis. And for example, Kornichuk wrote an article, among others, by the way, he was a husband of Wanda Vasilevsk and a well-known playwright. And very soon, he became a deputy commissioner for foreign affairs. So his article, which we've got here in the Polish translation as well, 
gave an idea of the argument of the Polish policy vis-à-vis -vis the Ukrainians before the war as a reason why the Soviet Union was against the legal and the political position of the Polish government in exile. And finally, what I believe is the most important and argument and the argument that's most difficult to defeat by Western politicians and the strongest argument. And uh, this is the fact that Stalin said he has to take uh, the feelings of the Ukrainians into account, including the Ukrainians who are soldiers of the Red Army. Let me now quote it extensively. The Soviet government must not hurt the Ukrainians. The most eminent commanders, like Bogdarenko, are Ukrainians. We can't hurt the, the Ukrainians. Stalin says, I'm old and I can't hurt people when I'm old. Remember, Ukrainians are demanding help. We have 1.1 million fantastic Ukrainian soldiers in the Red Army. We mustn't hurt the Ukrainians. Miguelic talks about it. Uh, talks about the fact that the Poles will be hurt. It's a working member from August 43. And Stalin says, Prime Minister, I definitely don't want the Poles to be hurt, either economically or territorially. But you have to remember that if you keep insisting, then there will be no friendship. And then he says that Wroclaw is not worse uh, than Lvov. He says that. Basically, Poland emerged as a large country, and as a result of this war, the Ukrainian and Belarusian nations will emerge as well. If I took their land, that would be an insult for them. Grabski says, but you can get the positive feeling of the Polish nation. Stalin, gentlemen, politics is not about feelings, it's about business. Grabski. Let me remind you that Lvov is a center of Polish culture. Kiev is the Ukrainian center. Stalin, we cannot insult Kiev by giving back Lvov to Poles. You have your culture centers in Warsaw and Krakow. The Russian version of the protocol was published in Lebedeva's, uh, Lebedeva's uh, publication and also in the 90s. You can see the emotional reactions of Stalin and Molotov, who are saying, what about Krakow and Warsaw? And the last argument, which was raised by the Soviet diplomacy and Russian emigres as well. For example, there's a big article about the Curzon Line, written in the 43 by Kerensky, the former prime minister of the temporary government. So this argument, both of these arguments were politically effective. The argument about uh, the Curzon line being a just line which is accepted by the powers, that's an argument that refers to a certain mental attitude of the West, which was basically since 1795. Obviously, it wasn't called that at the time, but going along the Bug line, it would separate what we call the Polish kingdom from the core lands of the empire. Now, Curzon line in the north was not an ethnical border. And the fact that Ukrainians and Belarusians are not Russians well, these arguments weren't that strong in the West. For Churchill, the Soviet Union is tantamount to Russia. So this line was there 
that for a number of generations was the sort of normal boundary between Poland and the Soviet Union. And at a moment of Russia's weakness, Poles managed to conquer some of these um, territories under dispute. But in the Western mentality, this was a sort of a natural border. And in, in October 39, Chatham House con conducted studies in the Curzon Line and whether it could be updated somehow. The arguments were rather on point and uh, for the Western politicians, that is. And first and foremost, the argument on Stalin, that he could uh, have a different kinds of approach uh, regarding Poland and Poles, but as a rule, the Poland should stay independent and separate from Russia, and it won't become, it wouldn't become 17th Soviet Republic, while Ukraine used to be part of, was part of the Soviet Union. The interest of its nomenclature even in the Stalinist system and uh, within the conditions, uh, within the war conditions, it all became so obvious and self-evident that uh, the, the, it led to a certain turning point in, uh, the, in all policies regarding nationalities. Russia and Ukraine became the, the founding members of the UN. Stalin uh, uh, instated a special order. Bogdan Khmelnytsky was a military decoration, the only military decoration in the Red Army, bearing symbols that did not refer to Russian, but to rather Ukrainian history. Then Khrushchev, while representing, without any doubt, the interests of the uh, Ukrainian nomenclature, often claimed uh, that the uh, ethnically Ukrainian uh, soil process should conclude, and so on. So uh, whatever uh, Stalin arranged was about uh, establishing the interests of the Soviet Union rather than Polish ones. Now we detach a little from uh, legal matters and uh, national territory of uh, Poles and uh, Russia or Ukrainians or Belarusians in this case. This is all rational. It was rational to think that Stalin would represent Soviet Ukraine um, in this, uh, in this uh, quibble. We must mention also the um, incomparable potentials of, uh, potentials of both partners. So Mikhoychuk heard from his counterpart that he uh, could not expect them to care more for Poles than for Ukrainians, and that was convincing. Now let's move on to uh, Polish arguments, since I've got five minutes left. First off, international law. The eastern um, territories were formally, since 5 February 1946, part of Poland. The Soviet aggression was not incorporation, but rather an aggression with the annexation as uh, as a result. So it was not recognized not only by Poland, but also by, by the Western powers. Then Ukrainian collaboration with the Nazis, uh, brought up in 1941 by Sikorsky. And I quote, did you not say that uh, Lvov was a Polish city? And Stalin said, yes, we will uh, end them uh, with you, said Stalin, uh, together uh, in the future. Sikorsky replied that this argument was uh, weakened by uh, 
by the fact that the Soviets uh, would transport two million Poles out into Siberia. In a document from January 1942, in a report on uh, Soviet approach to uh, national matters, and I quote, Stalin said um, he would help uh, me in the border issue so that we can break Ukrainians once and for all. Later on, in another report, uh, Sikorsky wrote uh, after his trip to the Middle East, wrote about the goodwill of the Soviets, uh, about the uh, um, goodwill of the Russians and the Ukrainian quibble. Polish diplomats and Sikorsky himself would often use an argument that the Poles do not collaborate and that the Ukrainians do. I'm summing it up here, but uh, the cultural bonds uh, of uh, the region of Galicia with Poland are often, were often brought up, uh, that one third of Galicia is really Polish. That's That was argument that was brought up in 1944. Uh, Stalin was ready for such a partition in 41, actually, and not in 44. There was an argument as well that the Soviet Ukrainians are different than Polish Ukrainians, that they're colonized, that they're denationalized, so to speak, and also that the Polish Ukrainians were Catholics. This was a strong argument in uh, talks with the Vatican. The Vatican would say that uh, to giving up Galicia to the CCCP uh, would mean a destruction of the Catholic Church on that territory. And finally, the most important, the most interesting argument, perhaps, not used very often, Stanislav Grabski mentioned it in his talks with Stalin together with Mikowajczyk in uh, August and October 1944, uh, also Oskar Lange, and the argument went as uh, following. To destroy the chance, it's uh, the opportunity to um, return on Wolf and be for it to become um, a source of constant struggle between Polish and the Polish and the Soviets would be a source of instability, ongoing quarrel. And Lange said to that that it is a situation, it was a situation, that is territorial claims. And I'm quoting Lange's memorial to Molotov from 1944, <laughs> is a matter that Neither Yugoslavia nor Czechoslovakia is uh, struggling with because they're not giving out up any kind of territory. We cannot afford that for the Polish government to be treated by its nation as an unstable, um, just like the Weimar Republic government. The Polish-Soviet uh, friendship would not have a stable basis and uh, would be a source of uh, intrigue and propaganda instead. These would be uh, probably supported by the uh, uh, foreign agents and will be source of danger. It, he actually anticipated uh, the Cold War. Cold War stemming from the fact that the Poles would never uh, make peace with such a deep cut to their territory. Now, I'd like to mention arguments that weren't brought up. So the plebiscite or the vote argument was not, was not mentioned, uh, while in November 1944, when the Committee of Ukrainian, I'm, I'm sorry, Argentinian Ukrainians sent a memoir to uh, the Polish ambassador to Argentina, uh, then conveyed to London, and. Uh, it went along the lines that uh, Poland has had nothing to lose because uh, they had no support in maintaining current borders. So why not invoke the uh, Atlantic Charter and the past of Ukraine? The Soviet Union, on the other hand, would not mention that much the stability of borders, the Curzon Line and so on. They would leave it to uh, the uh, Soviet allies in the West. The Volin massacre wasn't uh, mentioned either. Soviets, both Soviets and Poles knew what happened. Now let me quote a letter published uh, 
in Stanisław Paprocki's sources. He was responsible for the um, nationality matters in uh, the Polish government. Quote, the Ukrainian massacres, as Ukrainians themselves participated in them, uh, was a, were a huge blow, blow uh, to Polish-Ukrainian uh, relations and any matters regarding territory. Every time we mentioned um, that Ukrainians did not want it to, did not want to be part of the Soviets, the English would say would say that. But the Ukrainians hate you even more if they can afford such a terror against their own people. Thank you very much, sir. I would say that this uh, Ukrainian argument has a long history. I remember the situation uh, from 13 November 1938 when there were uh, Yosif Dugashvili, a commissar, uh, would issue a decree on uh, returning national souvenirs uh, stored in the Hermitage. It was all to show to the Ukrainian elites that the uh, Soviet Union was not uh, Tsar Russia, Tsarist Russia anymore. And all ended up with, if you will, a, it all ended up with a uh, attempt at the Hermitage and the uh, uh, director, the headmaster, uh, Tolstoy, uh, tells them off. Mikhail Polsha, the Minister of uh, Labor in uh, the Ukrainian Committee, actually reminded Jugashvili of the decree later on as a counter-argument. So uh, that's it. We've got half an hour for uh, Q&A. And uh, let us uh, have three questions now. Please introduce yourselves and state your question. My name is Staszewski. I'd like to go back to 1939. Professor Chubinski, in his book on the Second World War, wrote that the Germans were ready at the very beginning to create some kind of a Polish state, a puppet Polish state, and that Russia was against it, that Russia was against it. Could you, would you have any comment on that? Any other questions, please? Jakub Wojtkowiak. It's a comment rather than a question. Both uh, Professor Rutkowski and Professor Tablinka said or inquired what, what would happen if uh, and the Anders army was used in 1942. So I'd say that it's uh, irrelevant what the intentions were. If they had made it to the front, the Polish army would have been uh, crushed. The Russian actions 1942 in Leningrad with the second army, the second army was uh, crushed as well. These were the Russian forces. And uh, the other uh, part of the forces was completely crushed also by the Germans in April 1942. Later, all the forces grouped uh, on the southern front, first uh, during the failed offensive at Kharkiv and uh, during the second offensive of uh, the Germans uh, around Stalingrad and Caucasus. There was a huge gap in the front. The uh, Germans would enter um, without being battered at all. If uh, Anders's army uh, would have been there, uh, had had there been there, they, they would have been uh, crushed absolutely and evaporated. Professor Vos has a question. I am told. Yes, I'm. I hope I'm audible. I'm sorry, it's not easy to speak to you from the virtual reality. So two questions, two comments, actually. The first one, uh, referring to Dr. Hua's statement, and the second one more general. I'd like to 
focus on this uh, intergovernmental declaration signed on the 4th of December by Stalin and Sikorsky, but I'd like to shed a different kind of light on it. Knowing the Soviet diplomatic practice and uh, violent way almost of uh, accepting the contents of such document, let us, let us remember that these documents, even in wartime, were uh, negotiated uh, during months. And this one was accepted immediately and signed by Stalin himself. I know it was formally countersigned by uh, the formal head of government, but the very tempo uh, the rush in signing that declaration, that's uh, a gesture on in its own right. The declaration itself was new for the Soviets. It actually had appeared very shortly before it was signed. So that's a small, small uh, comment from uh, my part. By, and uh, another comment refers to Professor Rutkowski. He said that the Polish, Polish historians did not analyze thoroughly Sikorsky's visit or answer the question on when the Polish emigration government lost its uh, credibility in the eyes of Soviets. I would reverse the matter here and uh, ask what relevance did it all uh, have? We don't have a lot of answers, uh, but what we do know, let's see what predominates. Uh, the predominant content are talks with international partners, and 90% of the contents are their words, are their statements and speeches. So to distillate uh, the Soviet uh, position from that is very difficult. The correspondence, the messaging between the uh, the central government and the uh, representations uh, over the world is it's very hard to. Uh, this is very scarce, and uh, the contents are very small. The internal analysis of the uh, People's Commissariat are actually uh, not in the scientific realm as we understand it today. So we do have a, a, a wide array of contents uh, in diplomatic documents, but it is very one-sided. We know what Cripps said, what Sikorsky said, or what uh, Kot said, or whoever else. But we know all this from British, Polish, French, or other documents. What we do not have are the most relevant bits of Soviet document uh, of Soviet documentation, and this is part of the policy of this of disclosure or lack thereof. Uh, and this refers to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs today um, in Russia and its archives. So the historiography problems are explained partly by this. Uh, issue. Okay, we've had uh, two comments. Dr. Buhak and Professor Kornat would like to speak. Ladies and gentlemen, if you allow me, I'd like to pick on a couple of statements made here. These are very short comments. The first one would uh, be a comment on Professor Rutkowski's uh, comments on historiography. I must admit I haven't followed it very closely, but are there, there any serious, is there any serious research on the phases or stages in the approach of Soviet authorities to the people that found themselves in the Soviet Union. 
I'd say about 300,000 people that found themselves uh, on the Soviet territory and regarding whom the Soviet authority had would change its approach, uh, starting with the, 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 the famous amnesty that certainly did um, had a large impact because uh, it uh, restored, and I'm speaking as a, as a participant of, of that quibble I had 13 or 11 years, if I remember correctly. The, am the amnesty was uh, bestowed upon us. And so that was the starting point and the uh, finishing point uh, would be the transfer of power of their Polish diaspora uh, was uh, was handed the power was handed, handed over to Ms. Wanda Vasilevska. So that's one question that I dare to pose. The second question, I'd like to refer to Professor uh, Tabinka. The conversation between Stalin and Sikorsky. I uh, I uh, inquired about this in 1961 as a, as a complete layman. Um, I talked about this with General Kukel. And he said uh, in a free uh, conversation, unrestricted conversation, which I consider uh, important, he said maybe Sikorsky uh, did not avail of the opportunity to um, inquire further on what it meant for Stalin, his his, his famous chut-chut in Russian, what, what it actually meant for him regarding the slight modification of the border. So the general, to this regard, said, it's a pity, maybe, that uh, Sikorsky did not inquire further, further. So what, what did he actually meant by um, this, uh, this discreet comment on the further uh, future shape of the border? Also, let us remember that that was the uh, final period of the Polish-Soviet uh, relations uh, between Stalin, the Soviets, and the uh, government, the Polish government uh, on the migration. Actually, not the migration, it was just the Polish government. So we've got stacked. Uh, certain issues all at once. Cutting is one of them. I am unable to stack them chronologically, I'm sorry. So there is cutting, there is uh, the official, uh, officially the relations are severed because the Soviets uh, took huge offense against the Poles. And then starts the uh, so-called uh, reissuing of passports. So you wonder, could we uh, research further into what hit us on the Soviet territory? That is the uh, arrests of a number of uh, government uh, delegates in 1942. That's a very tough time for the Soviets. 
and they're seri they're still inclined to uh, to conduct some very serious uh, provocations. They arrest Mieszkowski, who fortunately was released after a number of years, and I met him. So what's, uh, doctor, I'm sorry, what's your third question? Okay. The reissuing of passports then, we were told to accept uh, the citizenship uh, yet once again, and that was a shock for all of us, because otherwise uh, we could have been sent to the Gulag for two years. So then, Professor Kornat, and we can close up this uh, Q&A session. The mic is on the way. I've got a number of uh, comments here, but uh, I'll be brief. I must say that all uh, these lectures were very interesting. Allow me to say one thing uh, regarding what uh, Professor Rutkowski said. Uh, we've mentioned Professor Doraczyński here. And I'd say we must uh, differentiate between what he uh, wrote in, uh, during the communist regime in Poland and after. I feel like we haven't discussed this. So later on, Professor Doraczyński had a very realistic vision of this helplessness of General Sikorsky, and I felt very much convinced by that vision. Second thing is that we must mention Mrs. Anna Cinciawa. Uh, she published two articles in the Polish Review on the concept of uh, Sikorsky uh, on Russia. So two uh, large feature articles and the author is unfortunately not with us anymore, but uh, I think it should be a big part of our historiography. Professor Tebinka said uh, before, uh, mentioned the uh, conversation between Stalin and Ambassador Romer. I, I've read this article in, uh, in the Zaszyte Historyczne. But regarding the comments, the Stalin comments to our ambassador, since he uh, reported to London on the contents of the conversation, then all pessimism is uh, justified. Tadeusz Romer was uh, an outstanding diplomat, that's for sure. As Dr. Huas, as Dr. Huas also said uh, something about the talks on the territorial matters, uh, and I'm, I wonder whether uh, there were actually two ideas. One that emerged during his uh, during Sikorsky's uh, return from Kuibyshev, and then uh, another one uh, mentioned by Kot. Maybe Professor Adamski would add something on this. And lastly, I've got two final comments, general ones. We all must realize uh, just how um, how bad of a hand General Sikorsky was dealt. If he was looking for help uh, with the Brits, uh, we must ask what they what he could offer in return. There are two arguments. First, uh, to drop box, uh, Beck's uh, policy, so drop the policy of uh, balance and uh, so-called Prometheism. A declaration uh, back then also that uh, Beck would not return to his balance, balancing policy did not mean a thing. The second argument was that Polish Catholic country back then as well um, agreeing with the Soviets uh, would uh, give them an additional argument that uh, the Russians, that the Soviets had a stronger position uh, in uh, the West as well. 
As Professor Dabinka said, and I, I'm not trying to uh, debate it, but uh, the decision, the, 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 the fact that there was a decision to um, bring Poles under control, I think it was always there, and it was the uh, way of subduing Germans. Okay, so which one of our panelists would like to start? Dr. Huas, I see you. The floor is yours. To pick up on Professor Kornat said and his potential second uh, trip to the USSR. Yes, uh, there was an idea to do this. We can't hear the comment from the floor, and it's made without a microphone. Yes, there was an idea like that, but I think that in the political situation that Sikonsky found himself in, grabbing any opportunity as it appeared, instead of postponing things until later, if you didn't even know if the meeting would even take place, I don't think that was the best solution. I know that now, after 80 years elapsed, it's easy to say what was a good idea and what was a bad idea, but also to pick up on what Mr. Bullhag said, I agree with the statement that even if Stalin signed something good for us, about borders, it wouldn't really come to pass anyway. But trying to inquire what he meant and maybe later use it in later political negotiations or as an argument um, for the British, that may have been beneficial for our cause. Now, about uh, not getting a very good hand, uh, yes, Sikonsky had a very weak hand. But I'm not sure if he realized how weak it was. Now, this may sound a bit patronizing towards a statesman, but I think he had a very high opinion of himself, and that impacted the decisions he made. When he came to Moscow, by the way, on the 1st of December, he talked to Vyshinsky in Kuybyshev. Then, in the conversation with Stalin, he repeated what he said to Vyshinsky. Namely, he said he was an advocate of the Soviet uh, case when talking to the British. So he tried to present himself to the Soviets as the middleman without whom the Soviets wouldn't be able to sort out important things. Edvard Benesch actually took on this role throughout the war, but that's the sort of thing that Sikonsky said in this conversation. So he, that sort of shows you the, the weakness of some of his um, line of thoughts about important things. I'll be, I would like to ask a question later, but maybe I can do it now. I loved it how you talked about these arguments about the eastern borders. One thing that I found missing that you might not consider important is when I look at documents from that period, especially British documents, I'd say that the single most often used argument was that through these new borders, uh, the Soviet Union wants to assure its safety. And this was repeated so much that uh, after repeating it so many times, the British were happy to say, well, yes, the British have to ensure their safety. If that happens, they won't have further demands towards the West. Yes, definitely, this argument was used, but that was in the relationship with the British. Stalin could hardly tell Poles about it because that would be suggesting that Poland was dangerous to him. 
I would have to probably study these documents again very carefully, but I think that uh, was not used in the contacts with, uh, contacts with the Polish diplomacy, not directly at least. I mentioned arguments that were used in mutual relations. Maybe I uh, didn't make myself clear. I meant the arguments that were used in mutual talks between Poles and the Soviets. Now, the, the Sikorsky as an optimist, um, he was uh, an optimist, he was uh, conceited as well. I believe this could be treated as an advantage. A politician who doesn't believe in the ability to create the reality around him becomes uh, inefficient. Sosnikovsky, General Sosnikovsky, was a great analyst, a great patriot, but he was, I believe, unable to make radical political decisions. And that shows, you know, if we try to play the psychologist, the the uh, attitude on the part of Sikorsky that things will always be good. And Sosnikovsky had the Pygmalion effect that things will be bad. There was no defenders who can only try to survive. If you keep repeating that, if you keep, keep repeating something, then you start acting according to what you keep repeating. And suddenly you become part of the very reality you want to avoid. Now, encouraged by these two presentations by the professor that I agree with uh, about the gaps and the things we don't know, and I agree with your line of thinking, but what I can say is that based on all the sources that I know that were published so far, I think that Professor Tabinska's interpretation is correct, namely, there was a point in time when, for one reason or another, Stalin was interested in finding a way of living with Poland. And let's remember that the things that's made their way into the records of the meeting doesn't necessarily reflect all of the talks they had on the 3rd and 4th of December. So, in general, I would interpret Stalin's policy as follows. In 41, in December, he was ready to, he was prepared to give Lvov back to Poland if the populations were exchanged. So then the argument of the Ukrainian case would have been removed. Without Ukrainians, a pro Ukrainian policy can't be uh, conducted. And they would share the fate of the Ukrainians before the war. They would be uh, oppressed. If we leave any Ukrainians in Poland, that will be an element that can uh, be a threat to the security of the USSR. And that's why he was prepared to uh, swap the population and have the border along the Curzon line. 41 was the period when he was coming to the conclusion that you cannot reach a modus vivendi. Also because of the mentality of the Polish emigres, certain weaknesses on the part of Sikorsky, and the fact that uh, the USSR was doing better in the war. So towards the end, he thought that uh, this would have to be imposed on the Poles without Lvov and along the Curzon line. Poles did not understand these uh, signals that were being sent by the uh, Soviet diplomacy. We have released everybody who we had and don't dwell on the issue of the Polish and POWs and don't ask because n nothing good can come out of it. So Stalin understood Poles were not understanding these signals, so he moved on to imposing his own solutions 
of the border issue to the government of London. And that was then interrupted by Katyn. When it emerged until June 44, it seems to me there was some hesitation whether to do uh, the variant with an alternative communist government or whether to force the Polish government to humiliate itself and get rid of Kot Sosnkowski and uh, several other politicians that were considered anti-Soviet. I don't think there was a final decision because unofficially contacts were continued with the Mikowajic government about how to restart the relations all the way until June 44. And finally, the fourth stage, when the July offensive succeeded, the um, PKWN, and we know from Churchill's words that Stalin was going to agree to Mikowajic as prime minister in October 44, but the maximum that was possible to achieve was a 50-50 split. A Soviet British condominium and then Sovietization. So these plans evolved. Yeah. Professor Tabinka. Uh, let me try to answer the question you asked. I agree there was this idea of the former German ambassador to Warsaw, Otka, men prepared a paper in Alton 39 of leaving a rump Poland from the lands that the Germans didn't want to annex annexate. And Moscow was against it. And Moscow said very clearly to Germany that a state, a Polish state like that, will keep plotting against everyone. And they were right that would be a satellite uh, version of the country. We shouldn't only blame Stalin for not for what is not happening. And that may have meant that this horrible terror of 1939-40 wouldn't happen against the Polish leadership. But it seems that Hitler and Himmler weren't really cons convinced the issue of a potential coming to terms with the Allies in London and Paris was, in the late 39 was another thing. Although Berlin didn't really want to get rid of the gains in Poland. Now, from the point of view of Moscow, what was considered Poland was the territory under the German occupation. In November 40, Molotov went to Berlin, and in his instructions was a very clear item that uh, he should talk about the Polish issue and what Berlin wanted to do this area in the future. He did not talk about it in those talks. Some new elements emerged, but I'm not going to dwell on them. Professor Wojtkowiak mentioned the issue of a potential use of the Anders army. Uh, Professor and myself didn't speculate about it. But if we were to ask these questions, I'm not quite sure that those units would have been destroyed or disseminated or squashed, as you said. It would all depend on when they were used and what section of the front. In that particular year, starting from the fall of Sevastopol and the offensive towards Stalingrad, the center and the north were not places of any huge German successes. The losses of the Red Army 
in the fighting were naturally considerable. So even if we ascribe any evil intent to the Russians, we can't check it anyhow because the units that were used on the front line were getting huge losses. It should be noted, however, in terms of using Czechoslovak units, for example, well, I hope we'll, the next panel will talk about it, but let's uh, remember that the Free French also had the squadron which then grew in size. But I don't want to say that that would have changed anything as far as the uh, Polish um, case is concerned, our military presence. So this is just uh, playing what if. And this uh, a little bit that was mentioned, that, that how the borders might be modified a little bit. That's an interesting issue. How much was meant? Sikonski clearly didn't want to get involved in any talks about modifying the territory. Didn't want to signal that he was ready to uh, uh, for any concessions. But that's definitely a very interesting thing to ask about. Professor Vovos mentioned these far reaching weaknesses of the policy documents. When I looked at the PDF file from 1943, I was hoping for some interesting things, but these are mostly notes and the records of the talks, some of which were very interesting, but it's more of uh, instructions for uh, diplomatic posts and that sort of thing. So it's not that interesting. But one thing is interesting as far as uh, diplomacy is concerned in the, the Soviet Union. It's not that only they did uh, wrote one thing but did another thing. Mansky's memorandum is very well known. He was already an employee of the Moscow headquarters. And he said that Czechoslovakia would be the ram used by the USSR in its uh, Central European policy. And he said it was not in the interest of the USSR to build a strong post-war Poland. But if you look at what happened in Potsdam, at the conference, it's hard to say that he followed the memo. Uh, certainly, the circumstances changed, and uh, the temporary national unity government was there. But he definitely wanted to punish, and, as Dr. Hua said, build a new order in terms of uh, security. The Americans and British, under, after much hesitation, agreed. And it's worth remembering today, because these days we sometimes say that this territorial order was imposed by the USSR. That's not true. The British and the F Americans lost their will to support that shift of Poland towards the West as a result of Potsdam when the Cold War started and when West Germany was created. And let me just answer Professor Kotlan. This conversation, I appreciate the fact that he was a good diplomat. But what does that um, have? What significance does it have? I don't claim he didn't understand what Stalin wanted to say. On the contrary, his reports of the Russian Polish relations were very good. Uh, ever since he came to Moscow in February and March, he was frustrated that London didn't allow him to act more openly or that there was some declaration from London Moscow believed to be hostile, which they were, which made his diplomatic activity harder. 
Now, an analysis of this conversation would be needed. I sadly didn't do it. Because it's very close to the context of Roma's conversations with Molotov later on. Now, one last thing is that uh, when he was unexpectedly summoned to talk to the Prime Minister of the USSR, all he was able to offer was that the Home Army would carry out sabotage on the lines leading from the west to the east. Stalin said thank you, said that he was concerned that too many Poles would be, would be killed. That's too risky. He didn't need the Home Army. Outside of Belarus, the Soviet partisans were not as strong as propaganda said, but in spite of that, he didn't need um, the Home Army effort. So whether this was the last chance conversation before the breakup, paradoxically, Goebbels' propaganda and the passivity of our allies would make it much easier for Stalin to find a pretext or an excuse to break up the relations. I do have the impression that regarding the volumes from the Second World War, uh, we are reproducing the Soviet policy based on the symptoms. The spectrum of questions and analysis is rather superficial, it's limited. And I feel that there's still the necessity to try and analyze the policy regarding Poland based on Polish documents as well as British, the British ones, the American ones, and the Soviet ones that we do have. And then this would give us a, a fuller picture. The questions will be deeper. And without this uh, Soviet background, the question on the possibilities of Polish policy uh, will be very limited as well. We can't possibly say whether there were uh, gaps that could have been filled and so on. Regarding the questions uh, posed by Dr. Buchak, there is re research already on the post 25th of April 1943 in the Soviet Union. The reissuing of passports was also researched into by Daniel Rutkowski and other researchers. Uh, there is loads of material on the regional policy uh, of the Soviets regarding Poles and Polish army. And uh, it gives us a more full picture. I do not mention the uh, um, communist regime era writings of uh, Professor Dorachinsky. But uh, as Professor Voos has said, the question is whether this 4th of December declaration was a symptom of a deep change. Well, it was interesting. But uh, its uh, relevance was limited. It did show that the Soviets were interested in uh, using Polish propaganda. However, no deeper strategic thinking was behind this. But the question that I pose, um, whether there was a long-term plan, any plan, that there wasn't a detailed question, really. What we do know today is, has been already said by Professor Tabinka, as well as Dr. Adamska. So that's the structure. But the structure should be filled with more, at least, hypothesis, I think. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, thank you. I appreciate your contributions. And now let's go down to the ground floor and 
at 2.45 p.m. we shall meet back here.
Raz, dwa, trzy. Już. Raz, dwa, trzy. Proszę Państwa, będziemy powoli zaczynać. Mamy już mały poślizg, pięciominutowy, a organizatorzy tutaj przestrzegają, że powinniśmy... Ladies and gentlemen, we're about five minutes behind schedule, so we should be starting now. I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me. It's going to be a pleasure to chair this last session in the afternoon. It is the last part, but it's um, very important, I think. So far, we talked about the bilateral relations between the Soviet Union and Poland with some British elements as well. Now, uh, we will try to develop these topics. I will start with three texts or three presentations, and the, the Czechoslovak aspect will be very important here. And I will ask Professor Radosław Żurawski Velgrajewski from uh, Łódź University, an eminent uh, expert on diplomacy in the 20th and the 19th centuries. Uh, you wrote about Hotel Lombard. And you're also the author of a great publication on the uh, relation on the diplomatic relations between Czechoslovakia and Britain in the Second World War. And this is uh, the main thrust of your presentation. It's about the impact of the Soviet factor on the relations between Britain and Czechoslovakia during the Second World War. Uh, Professor, over to you. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for inviting me to this conference, which is a bit of a sentimental uh, trip back to topics that I did uh, concentrate on over a dozen years ago. Ever since, I have not been working on the British-Czechoslovak relations in the Second World War, so this presentation today is also was an opportunity for me to go back to something I wrote a paper on in the past and I used to focus on. And I would like to formulate these questions slightly differently. The title of my presentation is uh, that it includes the Soviet factor uh, the impact of the Soviet factor on uh, the, the shaping of British-Czechoslovak relations. So first of all, what are British-Czechoslovak relations in the Second World War? That's the first question. Nobody has any doubt how to perceive the United Kingdom, but what does Czechoslovak mean? It's more complicated than um, it seems. After all, after Munich, it's the second Czechoslovak uh, Republic, and it's written with a hyphen, Czecho-Slovak. We had the uh, Moravian Protectorate, and then we have Slovakia, which was basically uh, a puppet state for Germany. Additionally, there were large groups of Czechs, Czech and Slovak emigres in France and in Britain, and by no means were they a single political camp. On the contrary, these different political forces competed very fiercely with each other for some time. And then the Yaksha group, the Social Democrats, the Sudeten Germans, who, were, who had emigrated and were fiercely anti-Nazi. So when we talk about whether and how the Soviet impact was present, especially in the light of there being so many different Czechoslovak entities. I think before we answer this, we have to make this pretty obvious statement that if the Soviet Union was pretty much a German ally in the first part of the war, then consequently, 
niezbyt określonego i także niezbyt istotnego w tym momencie a rather minor ally like the Czech emigres. They were insignificant in the first part of the war, and that's why the impact of the Soviet Union was also insignificant. However, the Czechoslovak factor grew in importance as the war went on. Now, before the outbreak of the war in May, when Benesch, as a Chicago University professor, wrote a letter to the League of Nations, and it was not processed as a private person's letter, and that's when the Soviet diplomacy uh, represented him, so to say, by passing this letter on and presenting it at the League of Nations, forcing everybody to deal with the letter, which would not have been the case if it was just a private person's letter. But these were just minor situations, minor incidents, so this impact wasn't very very big. And this is how it went on for the first part of the war. In a moment, Professor Smetana will speak. He's an eminent expert on this particular topic, and I'm sure he will tell you more about the relations between Czechoslovakia and uh, the Soviets. So they were naturally there, but the question is, did it impact the British views in any way? Basically, I have found just one argument that shows how this factor might have influenced certain things done inside the Foreign Office. And that was the knowledge about the contacts between uh, the Czechoslovak and Soviet intelligence services. At that time, that was before the German attack on Soviet Union, of course. At that time, the Foreign Office believed this may be a useful tool in the British hands to stir trouble between Germany and the Soviet Union. So they were hoping that using these contacts, uh, the allied relations between the Soviet Union and Germany uh, might be disturbed somehow. Uh, the Czechoslovak communists' anti-war propaganda in the UK was also seen. That was obviously very close to, considered very close to the Comintern and the international communism, so they were deemed responsible for this anti-war propaganda. This propaganda was also targeting the temporary Czechoslovak government, but also the United Kingdom as the one who ran an imperialistic uh, war against uh, the German workers who were put in uniforms. Now, the Soviet factor is very clear in the British Czechoslovak negotiations of a full recognition of the Czechoslovak government in exile. So then the, uh, the adjective temporary government would be deleted because it was recognized as temporary after the fall of France in 1940. In July 41, when the German attack on the Soviet Union was already underway, there was a uh, breakthrough as far as the British Czechoslovak relations are concerned in the Second World War. Now, after June 40, the fall of France, to June 41, Britain was the only power fighting against uh, Germany with which the Czechoslovak National Committee and the temporary government had diplomatic relations with. And the UK 
was counted on by the Czechoslovaks as the only possibility of regaining independence. So in that period, the UK had an exclusivity position, so to say. This ended the moment the Soviet Union joined the war. On the British side, there was always this conviction, which is true, that the Czechoslovak-Soviet relations were very good and indeed friendly, and that made the Czechoslovaks, I will be using this term, that made uh, that differentiated Czechoslovaks from Poles. The Poles were always considered to be potential troublemakers in contact with the Soviet Union. The Czechoslovaks were believed to be those who could be some sort of a bridge. Now, in retrospect, going back to September 39, it was considered, it was very early September 39, after the start of the German aggression. So the question was whether maybe the Czechoslovak diplomacy could be used to persuade the Soviet Union to deliver some military supplies to Poland. Now this also shows um, the, aware, the, the lack of awareness of the actual situation. If anyone at the Foreign Office thought this was even remotely possible, but this shows how Czechoslovakia was considered to be a country that could deliver some services as far as contacts with the Soviets were concerned, and maybe getting what Britain needed from the Soviet Union at a particular point in time. But that was 39. In 41, when the German aggression on the Soviet Union was underway, when the position of the Foreign Office and the British government was analyzed, and if we analyze also the Czechoslovak attitudes, we need to remember that on the one hand, we have what might be a potentially strategic partner, the Soviet Union. On the other hand, we have a relatively small group of emigres who were recognized by Britain as the Czechoslovak government. But uh, so far, they were nearly 100% dependent on the goodwill of the British government. So in June and July 40, uh, one of the situation had changed. The Czechoslovak authorities starting to use the arguments that refer to the position of the Soviets to effectively exert pressure on the British authorities to obtain full recognition of the government of the Czechoslovak Republic. Before that, the British avoided referring to any um, state hood of Czechoslovakia. They never mentioned the Czechoslovak Re Republic. They would use phrases like the Czechoslovak president, but they, they, they made it a point of avoiding using the word uh, the state of Czechoslovakia. And they weren't sure if uh, Czechoslovakia should be rebuilt um, like the country that had existed before the war. In July, Benes and the Jan Masaryk, uh, Czechoslovak foreign minister, obtained a great tool of exerting pressure on British diplomacy. The tool was the fact that Stalin told the British he would recognize the Czechoslovak authorities in exile, and he said that uh, without all the reservations that the British had formulated before. And there's an additional aspect when analyzing this in the Foreign Office. To start with, 
the Foreign Office believed that it was doubtful whether Stalin would fully recognize the Czechoslovak government in exile if, as they thought, Stalin would just establish a puppet government if he needed one. So why bother recognizing the government in exile? That was the line of thinking at the Foreign Office for a while, but very soon it turned out that indeed the Soviets were prepared to grant full recognition. And a race started who was going to do it first, London or Moscow. So the British lost the initiative. Suddenly they had to chase the Soviet diplomacy and they didn't do it. They lost this race. The Soviets turned out to be faster and they granted much wider recognition than the British had done up to that point. So the British recognition had some reservations and limitations on the continuity of the First Republic. The British uh, didn't want to be bound to any declarations about the borders of Czechoslovakia. For Stalin, all that didn't matter. And this was clear in further rounds of negotiation. I'm not going to talk about all of them, of course. We don't have time for that. But just a very telling quotation which shows us some of the dilemma that the British diplomacy faced when the Soviet recognition of the Czechoslovak government turned out to be much broader. So, this is something that was said after the Czechoslovak government was recognized, so it no longer has the adjective temporary. But this is still when another round of uh, British-Czechoslovak negotiations are underway. Benesh uh, demanded that Britain renounced Munich and uh, consider uh, that, that the British government consider Munich null and void. These negotiations drew on until August 42. In the meantime, the Soviets uh, had no problem meeting all of the Czechoslovak demands. And this is how one of the foreign office analysts commented on this, uh, uh, certain Frank Roberts who wrote the following in the minutes. Russian policy, as opposed to ours, is based on op opportunism, which means that they can give the Czechoslovaks very wide, uh, very wide uh, rights on paper. Incidentally, uh, diplomatic relations had been broken up by the Soviet Union in 39. And let me continue the quotation. Or any future Soviet intentions. We can hope, we cannot hope to compete with the Soviet government in this area, and we shouldn't. End of quote. So this is the moment when the, the British government realized British government, which had all different pledges um, and requirements, they understood that they now are limited and constrained by certain legal um, limitations that make certain decisions difficult, but the Soviet government can do whatever they like. They can sign anything, they can promise anything, then can, can they just abandon these promises later on and not do them. So trying to compete with the Soviet government was uh, doomed to fail. <coughs> we all know that the British system is based on case law. The continental thinking about a legal system makes us sometimes forget about how important this difference is. Benesh required 
the British to annul Munich, to, to make it null and void. In the light of the British law, Munich was entered into legally and was confirmed by the British Parliament. So for a British person, uh, they couldn't uh, get their heads around a proposal to pretend it was null and void if it had been legally approved. And it's not just about uh, moral issues, it's about a precedent. If we establish a precedent that a treaty that was legally entered into and the parliament confirmed it, then the consequences in the future might be completely unpredictable and dangerous if just one time we decided we can do this uh, vault fast even if it would be beneficial politically. But yes, in this case, they had to lose out against the Soviets because the Soviets didn't have these constraints. They could enter into any treaties they liked and then cancel them or just ignore them um, however they liked. So from July 41, there's a very strong presence which hadn't really been significant before a very strong pressure from the Soviets, and this is a tool in the hands of Benesh, which means that the Brits are constantly under pressure. The Czechoslovak dip diplomats tell the British, well, if you don't do this, we'll go to the Soviets, and they will do it much faster. They will annul Munich, they will recognize our borders, the same goes for the transfer of the German population, the issue of Chechen and the border with Poland. So, so the same trick would be used over and over again. And until the end of the war, the British were unable to find any answer to that. They just had to accept it. They did reply to the Czechoslovak diplomats who started using the argument that if the British authorities don't meet certain demands from Czechoslovakia, then the Czechoslovak public would turn their sympathies towards the Soviets and the West would lose out on the propaganda front. The Foreign Office responded that the British don't see a direct connection between the shape of the borders of Czechoslovakia and cancelling Munich or the degree of dependence of, the, of Czechoslovakia on the Soviet Union. So the issue of Munich or the shape of the borders were not related to how dependent on Soviet Union Czechoslovakia would be, so they can't be used as arguments. I think I can say that between July 41 and December 43, which is Benesh's visit to Moscow, there's some sort of uh, equilibrium of the influences with the Soviet influence growing, but British diplomacy still played a very important role as a Benesh's ally, you know, ally of the Benesh's government. In his house. However, 43 uh, is a threshold. And the Polish case comes into play which had a significant impact on the attitude of the British towards Benesh and the Czechoslovak government, which earlier negotiated about a Polish-Czechoslovak confederation. Uh, that's a completely different topic, and we could talk uh, at length about why these negotiations took part and why they even bothered taking up this initiative. One way or another, the British supported a confederation of Central Europe as a response 
I've only got three minutes left. Okay, well, if, if that is the case, I'm not going to talk about the con Confederation. But Beneš's visit to Moscow that the British protested against very fiercely, especially that was announced right after Katyn when Poland broke off diplomatic relations with Moscow. <coughs> so the initiative to visit Moscow and sign a Czechoslovak Soviet a treaty was construed to be a step done at the worst possible time and a step that would deepen the isolation of Poland and that would cause problems for British diplomacy. So the British protested against it very much and they received a postponement of this visit from Benesh. Instead of July, it took place in December. So that was a watershed year, a watershed moment for the British Czechoslovak relations, even though formally they came back to a pretty good condition, but de facto, from that moment on, Benesh and the Czechoslovak diplomacy was started to be considered as a more and more pro-Soviet factor. A factor is so important that in the case of conflict would probably pronounce on behalf of, uh, in favor of the Soviet, Benesh argumented. The Brits uh, did want to see it that way in some analysis as well. The, the, the Czechoslovakia could become a bridge between the East and the West, having good relations with both the Soviets and the Allies. Especially one politician uh, uh, became disenchanted at this point with uh, Banish. Now, regarding diplomacy post-1945, I'd like to say that the British returned to their 1938-39 state, so to speak, with a different candidate for European, for Central European hegemony, though. The, Brit the British uh, tried to uh, drop any responsibility for this part of Europe. The Russian diplomacy did make it easier for them by convincing about the, uh, the good intentions of Stalin that neither Czechoslovakia nor Hungary nor Poland would uh, be in danger. But Benesh did speak to Stalin in Moscow, and the uh, records we have of these conversations are shocking, rather, because Benesh wants uh, the occupation of Poland, of Hungary, and uh, promises uh, internal transformations in Czechoslovakia as well. The British do not know that. We do know this now, thanks to documents, but the pro-Soviet option emerges at that time. As far as Banish is concerned, um, he uh, walks into a trap, really, because first he thought there was no danger from to be expected from the Soviet Union, but he soon becomes a uh, submit to the Soviet Union. He went to Moscow, he uh, announced a new government. In London, this was construed as as according to the words of uh, Rice Locker, it's one of the friends, actually, uh, allies of Banish, very favorable to Czechoslovakia. He wrote that if only Banish could make the decisions uh, on his own, Fierlinger would have never become uh, a prime minister. So this act, disappointment, was uh, construed in London as uh, evidence for uh, the Czechoslovakian government's submission to Moscow. Earlier, there was an uprising in Czechoslovakia. It's yet another uh, issue that we don't have time for at this moment. But the British uh, at that time was thinking of uh, Czechoslovakia as the operational military zone uh, responsibility of the Soviets and did not want to interfere. 
But the Soviets did not uh, agree to this state of affairs and so on. So uh, Benesh was a necessary figure so that Czechoslovakia wasn't only at the mercy of Stalin. The British would rather not intervene. Another question remains. Uh, to what degree Benesh wanted this uh, Czechoslovakian uh, uprising to prosper. Just two more things I'd like to mention, if you allow me. A strategic decision by the end of the war, there appeared a possibility in uh, the minds of uh, Churchill and uh, British politicians to convince Americans to uh, press Patton, to press on, so that the uh, American troops could, uh, could take Prague. That would transform the political situation. It would be completely different if the Brits had uh, invite the Soviet diplomatic corps to Prague and not the other way around. But for political reasons, the Americans were unwilling to do this, were unwilling to uh, accept this uh, idea of Churchill. Now, Nichols, uh, an ambassador uh, with the Czechoslovakian government, had difficulties with uh, his return to Prague due to the problems that were set in front of him by the Soviets and Soviet diplomacy. So the delays were a um, Soviet diplomatic tool. The end of the war, from 1944 on, the British all in all acknowledged Czechoslovakia being in the Soviet uh, sphere of influence. They did see a threat, but they sort of acknowledged it and uh, uh, they rather intended not to act against the Soviets. Same like uh, in the case of the Warsaw Uprising. They decided not to help it uh, so that the Soviet wouldn't see it as a threat to themselves. Thank you, Professor, for giving us this uh, synthetic view of very complex uh, of the very complex issues on the Soviet, British, Czechoslovakian line, starting with uh, the legal matters that did have an influence on further political orientation of that entire zone. And the rest is history. Uh, also, uh, thank you very much for this uh, um, excerpt from Frank Roberts and his painful experience uh, of a Western diplomat against Soviet diplomacy and uh, how he experienced these limitations of the West. The next panelist that we have for you is Mr. Dushan Segesh, he should be with us online. I do am here, but let me know if you hear me. Yes, we do hear you, sir. So I'm, I'm reporting now from Austria as a hostage of a local, of a local lockdown here. Could you please uh, tell me what's been going on so far? There is no need. I think your um, your speech or lecture will be a natural continuation of what's been discussing so far. The Soviet factor in Czechoslovakia's policy towards Poland 1939-1945, that's the title of your um, lecture here. Let me just uh, add that Mr. Segesh is an author of a monograph work on especially the Slovakian part of this uh, problem. Thank you so much, and uh, thank you for having me. The dominant part of my uh, speech are the decisions made in 1942, 1944, and their consequences, including the Czechoslovakian agreement on mutual friendship and cooperation. I do acknowledge that the Polish and Czechoslovakian relations are impacted by 
other uh, other issues and other uh, stages in that history that I will obviate for obvious reasons. These relations were rather favorable in the first part of the war. And on 11 November 1940, both governments declared uh, the uh, wish to create a confederation after the war. So between 1941 and 42, there was a close, uh, close political cooperation on that matter. The Troika's decisions uh, and uh, also some uh, some contentious issues and the relations, the relations uh, between Poland and the Soviet Union were main obstacles uh, on the way to that federation post Second World War. Psychological differences in uh, Soviet reception, so to speak, uh, were also important because the Czech elites uh, had had no uh, previous contact with Stalinism or. Uh, totalitarian terror, so they could not uh, understand the arguments of the Polish government. Uh, Benesz did not understand the arguments and the other way around. So there were misunderstandings in political talks and some negative anti-Polish and anti-Czech stereotypes were uh, therefore strengthened. Both communists and social democrats would see Poles as uh, landowners and aristocrats. Many Slovaks uh, on immigration would be bothered by territorial and geopolitical matters. Uh, the Poles would often act uh, in a, um, a patronizing way, also politically. At the same time, there was a lot of sympathy for uh, the territorial claims made by the Soviets against its uh, neighbors, i.e. Baltics, the Baltics and the Central and Eastern Europe. One example I'd like to give you here of an event uh, taking place once the relations uh, between the Polish and Soviet governments uh, had been severed. There was a conversation with, uh, with uh, Slavik, the Czechoslovakian um, foreign minister, and Kot, Polish ambassador in Moscow. Kot claimed that they were all wrong. Uh, by believing Stalin. He said that, uh, he claimed that uh, the Soviet ambition is to have free hands as to do and take whatever they wanted. If they make it into Poland, they will take it all. They were pretty uh, lenient with you, he was speaking to the Slovaks, but uh, your time will come as well. He would say to Slavic that you left us, and uh, only a federation would save us. On the next day, after that conversation, the Slovaks said that the Poles cannot be reasonable, unable to be reasonable with the Russians. Minister Lipka said that the uh, Soviets honored their agreements. In case of a possible German failure, the Slovaks uh, claimed that the Soviet Union would be the main power and that this had to be taken into account. The Czechoslovakian president, unlike his Polish counterpart, was uh, could feel comfortable because he didn't have to uh, he didn't have any claims against his own country, territorial claims, that is. The Poles knew that Benesh would not support them in uh, Soviet territorial claims. The Slovak uh, political leadership did not want Polish leadership 
to prevail, and uh, therefore the Czechoslovakian government had reservations in regard of uh, the Polish, uh, Bulgarian, German, uh, Luxembourgian, and so on. Um, uh, that would be an integration in the future, European integration in the future. In 1942, Polish uh, Czechoslovak negotiation take took place, and uh, to no avail. There was no progress in that in that Confederate negotiation. The Slovaks would say that they didn't want the Soviets against them. There were talks with uh, Polish ambassadors, uh, among others Adam Tarnowski in 1942. Benesch claimed, and I quote, the confederation Polish-Czechoslovak is an internal matter of Poland and Czechoslovakia where the Soviet government uh, has no right to interfere. That's the declaration. But the Czechoslovak president um, acted differently with Soviets. In May 1942, in Moscow, Benesha probed whether he could talk directly to Stalin. In May 1942, both the president and his ambassador uh, were leaning towards Moscow and towards supporting its claims. In Moscow, they would uh, even doubt the intentions of Panesh regarding Poland. In 1942, the Polish prime minister was irritated by his Czechoslovak counterparts to which uh, he uh, received a, a declaration that that was not a problem. And uh, Poles replied by uh, giving an ultimatum. The Czechoslovak president replied to Sigorsky that they could deal without Poland, uh, they could do without Poland, to which Sikorsky agreed. So this kind of crisis is in uh, Polish-Czechoslovak talks on confederation would take place many times, but there were no uh, hopes for progress in this case. Benesh declined all Polish attempts at resolving the uh, um, the Tieshin issue. Benesh had a sort of a complex, a Munich complex, so to speak, so to speak, uh, so to speak. He would think that it would be more uh, beneficial for Czechoslovakia to have an agreement with the Soviet Union and not a confederation with Poland. Moscow acknowledged fully the Czechoslovak government and uh, they promised to acknowledge Czechoslovakia in the pre -Munich, within the pre-Munich borders in 1942. On 9 June, 9, uh, 9 of, the 9th of June 1942, uh, Benesh talked to uh, Molotov and promised that if Soviet-Polish relationships weren't going to be uh, amicable, then there would be no Polish-Czechoslovakian uh, confederation. Soviets were very satisfied with this. On the 15th uh, July 1942, Bogomolov told Jan Masaryk, the Czech uh, foreign minister, that uh, the Soviet Union was opposed to any confederative plans. Moscow vetoed later on all uh, alliance partnerships between Poland and Czechoslovakia. Benesh acknowledged that and uh, adjusted his political actions. He accepted the Soviet Union as, uh, as a referee and not as a mere, um, and not merely its opinions. He also uh, 
wanted to blame Poles for the failure of the Confederation negotiations. And also he tried to convince uh, Poles uh, that there would be no Soviet aggression, um, provided Pol the Poles would accept um, the uh, Soviet uh, territorial claims. However, the Poles, wanting uh, Poles to return to its pre-war uh, borders, which was actually similar to the Czechoslovak claims, uh, were seen as absurd. The Czechoslovak government changed its strategy and from November 1941 on started to uh, force uh, the idea of a um, trilateral agreement between Czechoslovakia, Poland, and uh, the Soviet Union. At the same time, he acted uh, strongly in favor of the Czechoslovak and Soviet uh, alliance agreement signing, which uh, happened in 1942 by uh, Molotov and Feininger. Tr the treaty was signed uh, with uh, the pre post war views. It was far more than just a bilateral agreement. Benesh talked to T Stalin in Moscow later on, and uh, um, tried to uh, speak in favorably of uh, Polish ministers. He said, and I quote, I don't see Polish government solving basic problems uh, internally and in relations with us. Maybe later there will be a new government in Poland that will have nothing to do with the London emigration government, and maybe we will be able to um, deal with that one." End quote. However, and I quote again, uh, that would mean eliminating the aristocracy and feudal um, figures in the government. It was a political maneuver to uh, adapt the uh, immigration Czechoslovak government to the no more confederation future post-war. In order to appease the British government, the uh, Czechoslovak Soviet agreement uh, was uh, there was an appendix, there was a protocol added to that agreement, uh, leaving an option, a purely theor theoretical one, to add Poland, to allow Poland to adhere to this agreement and make it trilateral. On 15th December 1943, the National Council held its session, which uh, said that the Czechoslovak-Soviet um, agreement was evidence of uh, the uh, honesty of Soviet intentions regarding Eastern Europe. The satisfaction with uh, the shape of Czechoslovak-Soviet relations was present also in Moscow. A report was handed in to Molotov. Mevan Maisky, his uh, deputy in London, said that the uh, Soviet Union wants strong Czechoslovakia, and given the agreement signed, it could be a vehicle of a serious vehicle for uh, Soviet influence in Central Europe. Maisky would suggest that uh, Czechoslovakia was a uh, an outpost of uh, Soviet influence in Central Europe. Whether this tendency of pro-Soviet foreign policy of Czechoslovakia uh, was seen favorably in the West remains a question, but rather not. Jan Masaryk was against, but he would always uh, be loyal to Banish and his uh, foreign policy shaping. 
the Slovak National Council and the Czech National Unity Council both sent open letters to, in 1942 to, uh, uh, to British Foreign Ministry claiming that the the Czechoslovak Soviet uh, agreement was null and void and did null and void and did not reflect uh, the will of the Czechoslovak nation. However, it was uh, rather irrelevant. In 1944, and I'm moving towards the end of my lecture, Benes uh, was acting here as a uh, well, actually an agent of Soviet influence in the uh, Polish-Soviet conflict. To no avail, he tried to convince uh, Prime Minister Mikołajczyk to accept Soviet territorial claims or to uh, reconstruct Polish government. In January 44, when talking to Raczynski, Benesz was less confident than usually. He said that these things were sorted out 100%, but there was no longer this euphoria in his speech. He said he was not going to interfere in the Polish-Soviet affairs. In return, he wanted for the Polish side not to criticize what he does. He said uh, these decisions have to be made, and we will be responsible in the future for our own decisions. Maybe it's me who's guiding my country towards doom, although I don't believe this to be the case. From then on, the atmosphere with the Czechs and Slovaks was worse and worse, and sometimes it was openly hostile. So the breakup between the Polish and Czechoslovak representation after the 30th of January 45, decision of the Czechoslovak government to recognize the temporary government of Poland, that was the last straw. There are very different interpretations of the 43 agreement. Sometimes it's called to be uh, the, the only realistic solution. Sometimes it is believed to be a voluntary Sovietization of the country. I personally don't support either of these extreme evaluations, although with some reservation, I would be closer to the latter. Given the character of Stalin's regime, Benesh, just like other representatives of uh, Czechoslovakia, was quite naive. The president was wrong in his evaluation of the policies of the Soviet Union. Um, it was clear, for example, as far as the <coughs> Transcarpathian Ruthenia was concerned, uh, in violation of the treaty from 1943. That treaty meant that Benesh did not renew Czechoslovakia and the pre-Munich borders. Benesh's another mistake was the wrong evaluation of the uh, Czechoslovak communists. And this was made clear in February 48, when the Czechoslovak communists took over power for over 40 years. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you very much. I think this tied in very nicely with what, with what uh, Professor Żuravski Belgrajewski said before. And we even had time to expand certain threads, like the issue of the, the potential confederation between Poland and Czechoslovakia, and how that project was abandoned. You mentioned the different ways in which Polish and the Czechoslovak elites 
perceived uh, the Soviet Union and that there's some amount of uh, being naive in claiming that the Soviets m always uh, make true all their promises. This basically resulted from not having the direct contact with Bolshevism. Now, it has been said at this conference before that the direct uh, that General Sikorsky in Poland also failed to represent direct knowledge or first hand knowledge of the Soviet Union. I will now ask our next speaker to take the floor, Vid Smetana, Professor Vid Smetana from the Czech Academy of Sciences in Prague. And we are following up in the same line. It, this is going to be a different point of view. Uh, the title is Czechoslovakia in the Soviet foreign policy, 1939-45. Let me just remind everyone that Professor Smetana is, a, is an eminent researcher and author of uh, a paper on the Czechoslovak place in British policy and a co-editor of a publication about the uh, London government in exile. Professor, over to you. Thank you, uh, for your kind introduction. Uh, and I would also like to thank to the organizers for this uh, invitation. It's uh, excellent, uh, interesting uh, conference. Uh, well, can I ask for the first picture? <laughs> Um, talking uh, or speaking uh, towards uh, the end of a long day, um, uh, moreover in a foreign language, I apologize for that, but my, my Polish is uh, very limited, so I decided for, for English. Uh, I have a difficult task to attract. assessment of the Czechoslovak role uh, within uh, the foreign policy of the USSR will uh, keep you uh, awake and I prepared uh, at least a few few pictures to, to make it more vivid uh, at the same time I, I apologize uh, for certain overlaps uh, necess uh, necessary uh, overlaps with what um, Professor Zhuravsky and uh, my good friend uh, uh, also Dushan Sergej uh, have, uh, have said. Uh, and I promise I will fit into 20 or at most 21 minutes. <laughs> uh, Soviet uh, Czechoslovak relations underwent a tumultuous development between 1938 and 1945 from cordial to relatively cold to much better than standard. Yet there was a constant clear will uh, on the part of the Czechoslovak representatives to have the best possible relations with the Soviet Union. Their real nature uh, thus depended mainly on the overall orientation of Soviet, Soviet foreign policy. Uh, Stalin's intentions in the period preceding uh, the Munich Agreement uh, of September 1938 are not quite clear uh, to this day. Uh, according to the documents that we have, uh, it seems, however, and that he was prepared to keep his commitment exactly in accordance with the Czechoslovak-Soviet Treaty of 1935. Uh, meaning depending on whether France fulfilled her obligation to Czechoslovakia. If not, he was not willing to risk an isolated war alongside Czechoslovakia against Germany. Although uh, Edward Benesch, who uh, had resigned the, from the presidency a few days after Munich and left his country, uh, repeatedly doubted uh, the alleged Soviet willingness uh, to come and help Czechoslovakia in any case, uh, in September 1938, uh, um, in the subsequent years, uh, the fact is uh, that securing a common border and a close alliance uh, with the Soviet Union soon became an important part of his program of redressing of Munich. 
with his Munich experience, he saw only two basic options uh, for the future of his country, either German dominance or a close alliance with Russia. Uh, promoting the latter uh, option uh, became a constant of Beneš's policy uh, and it was shared by an increasing number of Czechoslovak politicians. Immediately uh, after the German occupation of Bohemia and Moravia in March 1939, uh, the Soviet attitude toward Czechoslovakia and ex its exile representatives seemed to be very friendly. Uh, the Soviet government protested against uh, the German aggression and also backed uh, Banesh's protests uh, before the Council of the League of Nations against the German aggression as well as Hungarian occupation of Subcarpathian Ruthenia. The Nazi-Soviet pact uh, of the 23rd of August 1939 was soon reflected in Soviet-Czechoslovak relations, although it, initiate, uh, it uh, initially did not seem so. When Banner's hopes of achieving French and British recognition for his hastily composed exile government were dashed in the autumn uh, months of 1939, in two talks with the Soviet ambassador in London, Ivan Maisky, uh, he went as far as offering the Soviet Subcarpathian Ruthenia as an acceptable prize for reaching a common border with the USSR and thus security for, the, for his uh, country's future. Uh, according to Mar Maisky's record, he even talked, uh, talked about uh, a possible federative bond and um, an option of the Soviet system to be implemented in Czechoslovakia, uh, but I would keep a certain distance uh, from uh, from this. Um, it is not proven by by the ch by his own record, of course, but it is possible that he said something similar to uh, to what Maisky uh, recorded. The Czechoslovak exiles uh, indeed perceived the Nazi-Soviet pact positively uh, as an encouragement, inviting Hitler to start a war. And it very much deferred to the perception on the part of the British, French, the Poles, uh, quite naturally, because uh, the war was considered uh, to be the only hope for a future reconstitution of Czechoslovakia. Uh, of course, uh, it was displeasing uh, when the Soviet Union recognized Slovakia de Jure toward uh, the end of 1939 and closed down the Czechoslovak embassy in Moscow. Still, Edward Banesh, whose leadership of the Czechoslovak exile action was solidified by July 1940 uh, by the recognition of the provisional government, continued to ma maintain a connection with Moscow. And this paid off. While thousands of Polish officers were shot by the NKVD in the spring of 1940, Czechoslovak soldiers who had been detained after the Soviet invasion of Poland were released in several waves from uh, internment camps and transferred initially to France and later to the Middle East where they could fight against the Axis powers. Meanwhile, uh, Colonel Heliodor Pika, uh, head of Czechoslovakia's intelligence network in the Balkans, was invited to the Soviet Union in April 1941 as a Czechoslovak military representative for the Soviet Union and Turkey. And he was even given an opportunity to have an unofficial meeting with high-ranking Soviet officers even before Barbarossa. Uh, the German uh, invasion of the Soviet Union significantly modified the nature of Soviet-Czechoslovak relations and led to a recognition of the Czechoslovak government in exile in less than a month and enabling the formation of a Czechoslovak unit on the Soviet territory. Uh, this picture shows uh, returning of, of uh, Fillinger to his position of uh, then minister, later ambassador. Uh, during the months uh, and the years that followed, uh, Banesh repeatedly declared uh, to his collaborators that uh, his policy would be both east and west, or 50% orientation towards the, uh, the east, 50% uh, towards the west. However, the difficult negotiations with the British Foreign Office, which he had to undergo to achieve practically any of his foreign policy goals, 
compared to the easiness with which he was granted Moscow's consent with cornerstones of the program to redress Munich since the summer of 1941, ultimately brought the president to decisions, the consequences of which meant a prevailing orientation to the Soviet Union long before the war ended. His attitude was shared by a growing segment of the exile representation. These preferences were naturally soon reflected in the ongoing negotiations with the Poles on the Czechoslovak-Polish Confederation. I will ask for picture number two. Uh, however, this topic has just been covered by Dusan, and so uh, I would just uh, point out that the so-called Soviet veto on the Confederation from June 1942 followed uh, Banner's assurances that uh, cooperation with uh, June, July, actually, uh, that uh, assurances that cooperation with the Soviet Union was more important for Czechoslovakia than any combination with Poland. Uh, once he was promised Soviet support to the restoration of Czechoslovakia in its pre-Munich borders. Uh, both uh, the Soviet diplomacy and the extremely pro-Soviet Czechoslovak ambassador to Moscow, Zdeněk Fierlinger, stressed to banish that Czechoslovakia or Czechoslovak security could most easily be uh, ensured or attained by a Soviet-Czechoslovak alliance treaty. Its conclusion in the spirit of the principles of the 1942 Soviet-British Treaty, was officially proposed by Banesh to Moscow in March 1943. In Narkomindel, uh, the proposal was found to be an appropriate instrument to definitively avert plans for the Czechoslovak-Polish Confederation, and generally a move that corresponded to Soviet state interests. In April, Alexander Bogomolov, uh, the Soviet minister to the governments in exile uh, conveyed the, the official approval of the Soviet government and the call for the president to submit a draft treaty. Banesh was very satisfied and promised, uh, according to the Soviet record, that, quote, from now on he will follow the prospects of a close rapprochement with the USSR in his policy making, end quote. The British hosts attempted to distract Banesh from his plan, but eventually the project was approved by the Moscow Conference of the three uh, foreign, big three foreign ministers in October 1943. However, uh, it would be unfair to blame Banesh alone for Czechoslovakia's turn to the east. He was well informed about the strong pro-Soviet feelings within the home population, as well as amongst the exile community in London. On the other hand, during his visit to Moscow in December 1943, Banesh did his utmost to entangle Czechoslovakia with the USSR. Please, uh, picture number three. On the 12th of December, Molotov and Fierlinger signed the Czechoslovak-Soviet Treaty, uh, which was ratified in Moscow 10 days later. But the results of the negotiations between Banesh and Molotov went far beyond its wording. The president asked for coordination of Czechoslovakia's foreign policy with that of the Soviet Union and agreed with Molotov on the importance of such coordination. Banesh also called for a strengthening of the Soviet influence in Central Europe, including the seizure of Hungary by the Red Army, and suggested to Stalin that the problems of still feudal Poland could not be solved by the exile government, but by, quote, some kind of a new one. The Czechoslovak delegation further submitted a program of close cooperation in the military field and adaptation of Czechoslovak plans to the Soviet ones. Despite the fact that Banesh uh, successfully carried uh, through Article 4 on mutual non-interference in internal affairs of both treaty partners, he actually insisted that immediately after the war the Soviet government should interfere by encouraging uh, the Czechoslovak government to punish all Slovak transgressors. Uh, the Munich complex is, is in it uh, that Dusan Sagej has just mentioned. Uh, there was uh, euphoria in the Czechoslovak camp after Banesh returned to London. It seemed that Czechoslovakia's security was finally assured uh, for the future and even British reservations gradually vanished. Indeed, the Allied leaders Churchill, Roosevelt, Eden agreed that it would be appropriate to use Banesh as a conduit in the pressure campaign on the Polish leadership 
to meet Soviet territorial and other demands, at least a little, and thus allow diplomatic relations uh, uh, to be re-established. Uh, Banach's mediation was, however, utterly unacceptable for the London Poles. Moreover, uh, the Czechoslovak interpretation of the treaty according to which the country became part of the Soviet security sphere without losing any of its freedom and sovereignty was gradually promoted. The Western powers soon came up with the concept according to which Czechoslovakia was to become a test case on the Soviet, of the Soviet will to respect the sovereignty of small nations. Thus, in the spring of 1944, everything seemed to be on track, especially when Czechoslovakia managed to reach uh, an agreement with the Soviet Union on uh, the 8th of May on the ratio between the Czechoslovak administration and the commander-in-chief of the Red Army after its entry on Czechoslovak territory. The Soviets, however, viewed Czechoslovakia's role differently. An important memorandum by Ivan Maisky already mentioned uh, on the international situation and the Soviet political strategy labeled Czechoslovakia as early as in January 1944 a bulwark uh, of Soviet influence in Central and Southeast Europe. What further strengthened Czechoslovakia's drift to the Soviet sphere were statements that Edward Banesh made during his conversations with Soviet diplomats. Here, he only strengthened or confirmed Maisky's analysis, in particular uh, through his repeated affirmations that Czechoslovakia would side with the Soviets in the next war, in which the West would employ Germany against them, and for which it was essential to be well prepared. He said that in J July 1944 to the Soviet ambassador Viktor Lebedev, and he said something very similar uh, again to Molotov during his last visit to Moscow in March 1945, picture number four, please, which shows uh, um, Banesh at the airport in London, uh, carefully watched by the Soviet ambassador Gusev uh, on his... Uh, on his Right, uh, and uh, Ambassador Nichols, uh, full, of, full of worries, uh, on his left, uh, left hand side, in, towards his, his left uh, side. Uh, these uh, these statements were uh, undoubtedly uh, beyond mere uh, political farsightedness. Uh, Banesh thus effectively played to Stalin's lifelong sense of insecurity and endangerment from the West. The first signals uh, that the Czechoslovak model uh, might fail uh, appeared at the turn of 44-45 when the Soviets exerted pressure upon Czechoslovak representatives to give up the territory of Subcarpathian Ruthenia. The, NK the NKVD and other Soviet authorities organized uh, spontaneous uh, demonstrations of desire of the sub Subcarpathian uh, population to join the USSR, etc. Banish was uh, disappointed and blamed Ukrainian nationalism, uh, for he could not believe that this might be instigated by Moscow. Yet, uh, in January and March 1945, he confirmed in two letters to Stalin uh, his readiness to give up the territory, and that happened in June 1945. Second signal uh, of Soviet dominance uh, came in late March 1945, when Western diplomats were suddenly refused permission to enter the Czechoslovak territory, liberated by the Soviets. Thus, uh, the Soviet ambassador Valerian Zorin became for a month the only contact with the outside world uh, for the new Czechoslovak government that had been recently set up in Moscow and then moved to Košice. Characteristic for its composition was the, was the fact that most of the key positions were held either by the communists themselves, ministries of interior typically, and information also typically, or by their close collaborators, uh, such as the Minister of Defense Ludwig Svoboda and also uh, the Prime Minister uh, Zdeněk Fiedlinger. The former was a pro-communist non-partisan, uh, again in quotations, commander of the first Czechoslovak army corps on the Eastern Front, while the latter a radical social democrat and a highly pro-Soviet ambassador in Moscow. 
by 1944, the Czechoslovak government repeatedly asked uh, Beneš to replace him, as it was less and less clear whose interests he was defending. But Beneš refused these requests, knowing how Moscow appreciated his services. In March 1945, Stalin questioned the wisdom of Hitler's nomination when talking to Beneš, but as the new prime minister was a communist choice, Stalin had undoubtedly approved his nomination uh, previously. The program of the newly set up government, which was based on the communist draft, previously approved by the head of the, the Office of International Information uh, of the VKPB, uh, Georgi Dimitrov, preached uh, an alliance with the Soviet Union and prospectively also with the other Slavic countries and a mere friendship with the Western powers. The new government proclaimed that it would be, quote, from the beginning, uh, realized practical cooperation uh, with the Soviet Union in all respects, militarily, politically, uh, economically, and culturally. The Czechoslovak armed forces were to be organized, equipped, and uh, trained the same way like the Soviet ones, and uh, censorship was to be imposed against everything anti-Soviet in the field of education. To conclude, uh, I would say that Czechoslovakia played an active uh, role uh, in Soviet foreign policy throughout the war, either by fulfilling Soviet wishes or, more rarely, submitting to Soviet pressure, as well as by stressing Soviet credibility to the Western statesmen. By the time the war ended, Czechoslovakia had become a solid part of the Soviet sphere of influence. This did not occur through any dirty great power accord adopted in Yalta or anywhere else, but because of Czechoslovakia's own choice, and only naturally with the Soviet approval. It seems as if Banesh's strategy was based on two premises. First, the importance of the Soviet security guarantee against any repetition of German aggression, and second, the feeling that the country was at the mercy of the USSR, and the only way of preserving at least internal freedom was uh, increasing obedience to the Soviets. We now know that this policy failed. Uh, were there any alternatives? Possibly. It is often claimed that any different policy practiced by Banesh during the war years would have only resulted in his failure to return home as a president, similarly as in the case of the Polish London government. But the scale of historical as well as territorial differences makes any comparison between the two ahistorical. Thus, the Czechoslovak politicians certainly had the option to implement a friendly but at the same time a dignified policy towards the USSR. That would not mean fulfilling every Soviet wish, sometimes even before it was tabled in, in the Kremlin itself and not frightening Soviet leaders with the specter of a new war between the Slavs on the one hand and aggressive Germany and the West on the other. That was the absolutely uh, necessary prerequisite for being able to say enough to the Soviets at one of the turning points such as the Marshall Plan offer uh, in 1947. For Stalin and his subordinate, subordinates, it was thus enough to exert a relatively mild pressure in comparison to the Poles or some other uh, you know, nations to achieve his uh, geopolitical goals, such as Ruthenia. Uh, the rest was done by the Czechoslovak politicians themselves, partly out of their geopolitical conviction, partly due to the growing influence of the Czechoslovak communists. Of course, uh, the Comintern or the Office of International Information, VKPB, strove to strengthen uh, communist positions on the Slovak and Czech territory throughout the political instructions and agenda carried out by the commanders of partisan units and political commissars that were being sent there, especially on the eve throughout and in the wake of the Slovak national uprising. And one of their major tasks was establishing communist cells and spreading Soviet propaganda. Uh, yet that would already be a topic for another paper. I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much indeed, Professor. I'd like to assure you that uh, being uh, part of the last panel is to no detriment to um, 
the uh, attention of our listeners, and uh, that was very clear. Um, resume uh, conclusions uh, at the end. Both these lectures, the one by Dr. Segesh and uh, yours, Dr. Smetana, um, they both show certain common spots, common elements uh, of actions of President uh, Benesh and the way towards the position of Czechoslovakia that uh, submit that submitted to uh, the Soviet influence, uh, even though the pressure was rather soft. The Munich complex was uh, very important, and uh, well, many intentions of uh, the Slovak um, politicians failed. As you rightfully said at the very beginning, among the uh, unclear matters are the uh, the intentions of Stalin on the eve of Munich. We uh, do not have full access to the Soviet documents that would allow us to answer these key questions. And this matter in particular is certainly among the most relevant ones, especially that that today's Russian policy is largely based on the fact that the Soviet Union was ready to um, to fulfill the agreements it was uh, bound by, and that the uh, Ribbentrop-Molotov Pact was only a consequence of the betrayal in Munich. Now let's leave for a little while the the Central Eastern Europe, and let's move on to the Middle East. That's Mr. Wojtkowiak, who deals with uh, Soviet matters in the Middle East, uh, such as the uh, cleansing in the Red Army and the uh, uh, Russian-Japanese uh, relations. Professor, that's uh, what your lecture is about. The path to the Soviet-Japanese Pact on Neutrality, 1939-1931. Uh, that's the title of this lecture. Thank you for having me. Once I I learned about the topic of this conference, uh, I was confused uh, because first uh, I'm almost the closing act of this conference. And the topic of uh, my lecture is rather far away from the main, uh, the mainstream here. However, Japan was undoubtedly a relevant partner here. And the Far East is uh, also much more exotic for the Polish readers, Polish audience, than uh, what's been discussed so far. So we need certain introduction first in order to be able to uh, talk about the matters up to um, up to the 90, uh, up to the spring 1941. While we all know that the uh, uh, Soviet Japanese relations. Uh, made a U-turn in 1941. This is clear, but in, in um, b between uh, f fall 1939 and uh, spring 1941 is uh, rather unexpected. The Soviet Union and Germany battled, uh, struggled among themselves in between 1935 and 1939. The Third Reich was seen as a um, main antagonist. The Soviet Union uh, was uh, against the Third Reich ideologically, but the clash of interests took place uh, really uh, in the Spanish, during the Spanish Civil War, 1936-1939. However, 
uh, Soviet-Japanese relations in the second half of the 30s were extraordinarily confrontational. It was not only about clashing ideologies, but also uh, military struggles, indirect proxy conflicts. From uh, July 1937, a war is going on between Japan and China. In 1937, Japanese uh, invades China, which leads to the Soviet Union granting a far-reaching uh, support to Kuomintang. And this allows for uh, China to create the unified anti-Japanese front. So uh, a counterpart of the People's Fronts in Europe but in the Far East. These people's fronts during the sessions of common turn uh, were supposed to stop fascism and militarism, militarism that's uh, identified now with Japan. There are also direct military struggles, the most important ones taking place in summer 1938 at the Hassa Lake. And then the conflict between uh, on the Mongolian uh, Manjurian uh, border. And then the news hit about the Ribbentrop Molotov Pact. And I do underline that in the mutual relations there were there was, there was a number of issues, unresolved issues. And the basis for the bilateral relations between the Soviet Union and, uh, and the Japanese Empire were two documents, two humiliating documents for the Russians, for the Soviets. First, the Portsmouth uh, Agreement made after the, uh, after the defeat against Japan. And, uh, the Beijing Convention from 1935 that recognized uh, the Soviet Union. Japan recognized the Soviet Union. However, that was in return of certain concessions towards Japan and in exchange of uh, the um, occupation of Sakhalin or the part of it that uh, was still occupied even though the Japanese uh, military left in 1922 from the majority of the territory. So these two documents were sort of uh, at the basis of the relations at that point. Let us not forget about the uh, the licenses to uh, drill and uh, drain and mine in Sakhalin uh, by the Japanese and some uh, licenses for uh, for fisheries uh, in Soviet waters by the Japanese fleets plus post-1935 uh, a new uh, agreement was uh, negotiated to secure the rights of um, Japanese uh, fishermen. However, as a consequence of the uh, anti comintern pact, the Soviet part decided not to sign this agreement, not to sign this new uh, agreement, and would use it every year from then on uh, to exert pressure on Japan on every occasion. From the Japanese standpoint, the military support uh, given by the Soviets to nationalistic China was highly relevant. And when the news came about the Ribbentrop-Molotov Pact being signed, Japanese was already in midst of a direct military conflict with the Soviets on the Mongolian-Manjurian border. 
właśnie podpisanie paktu Ribbentrop Mołotow, które zostało przyjęte So the very signing of the Ribbentrop Mołotow pact uh, was seen by the Japanese as a betrayal as a betrayal by the most important partner on the international scene. There was uh, this obligation within the Molotov Pact to uh, not undertake. Uh, pa part of the anti comintern Pact was uh, not to undertake anything that would uh, allow the enemies of its parties to any kinds of actions. However, the Japanese ambassador was informed about the uh, Ribbentrop-Molotov um, pact signing on the eve of Molotov's, uh, of Ribbentrop's visit to Moscow. So the Ribbentrop-Molotov pact plus a uh, decisive um, military action led by Marshal Zhukov, a successful one, but uh, not as successful as it was later described by the propaganda, because it led to the uh, to, to, to one uh, infantry division uh, of uh, Japan being crashed. These two events then uh, led to a revolution in the Japanese political uh, scene. A government uh, that was in favor of uh, working closely with the anti comintern pact allies, that is, Italy and uh, the Third Reich, fell. And therefore, the Japanese political scene was later dominated unexpectedly by forces that saw as a priority to seek uh, some kind of uh, common ground with Anglo-Saxon powers uh, on one hand, and on the other hand, to normalize uh, the relations with the Soviet Union, finding itself in serious crisis in 1939. So this conundrum opens period of the two parties coming towards each other in order to normalize uh, the, the mutual relations. And in 1941, in April, it led to the uh, signing of mutual agreement. Once the uh, Soviet victory was uh, attained at the mongolia manchurian border, and uh, that the territory was uh, sort of recognized, uh, recognized as uh, pertaining to uh, Mongolia, the Soviet Union realized that it was necessary to calm things down before the uh, any uh, initiatives against Poland. So, Soviet Mongolian um, parties, and then Japanese Manjukuo on the other part, could focus on solving the uh, border issues and on the prevention of further conflicts in the future. Finally, the Japanese side. Uh, initiated a uh, commerce uh, pact and wanted the uh, fisheries agreement from 1936 to finally enter into force. Decisively, the Soviets claimed that the Japanese uh, should uh, solve yet another issue. The basis for the Soviet uh, sphere of influence in the north uh, eastern uh, China was the so-called Eastern China Railway. In 1935, it was taken over by the uh, the Soviets, and it made it led to Soviet domination, commercial but also sort of political, in that region. 
once the Kwantun army um, entered into Manjuria and uh, created the Manjukuo puppet party, and the uh, puppet state, I'm sorry, the Japanese took over and uh, sold the 93rd, in 1935 the railway to Manjukuo. However, the Germans, the uh, I'm sorry, the Manjurian uh, Japanese uh, part declined to pay the last installment for that railway. And after a year, the Japanese, or Manjukuo, formally decided to uh, pay that debt. And then the Soviet Union decided to uh, extend the fisheries agreement for the next year, 1940 in that case. The fall of uh, the defeat of France or the German military um, action in Western Europe, more generally, was a clear marker, chronological marker, um, in this regard. Japanese elites did want to uh, ameliorate their uh, relations with the Anglo-Saxon powers, and additionally, a tendency became stronger to strengthen the relations with the Third Reich. However, the situation was different than in uh, than before August 1939. The pro-German or pro anti common turn tendency, as it, it's a certain uh, simplification here, but we can call it that way, was that the decisive partner for solving all kinds of issues with the Soviet Union and uh, in the best case scenario, on the basis of a an important international law act was necessary there was a mixture of uh, influences of different kinds, uh, France, Indochina, uh, Germany uh, conducting military initiatives in all over Europe and over British Isles, and paradoxically, um, during this uh, period, the, ten the uh, anti-Soviet tendencies uh, sort of did a U-turn in order to sign a sort of, sort of general agreement with the Soviets instead of solving uh, particular issues one by one. That's about Japan. Yet another one of these two um, pro-Western uh, governments, the government of Mitsuma Sasiya 9, uh, in July 1940, had to respect the army's wish to enter into a neutrality pact with uh, the Soviets. Shigenori Toge, an ambassador who represented uh, Japan in Moscow for two years, presented this proposal to Molotov in July 1940. It was supposed to be a modest document, three bullet points. First one, the Beijing Convention as a basis of mutual relations still. The second one, the obligation of both states to respect the territorial integrity and neutrality of the other in case any of the parties uh, would be attacked by a third country, by a third state. And the third bullet point, um, 
Expiration date, five years. And it, uh, certain elements uh, emerged during the signing of that agreement uh, that would be visible throughout the next nine months. Molotov said, and I quote, both governments are interested in the changes of the situation in Europe not happening uh, with uh, being passive. So both the Soviet Union and Japan are interested in not being um, uh, not sustaining any damages and uh, the situation changing. Until so, the uh, Soviet-Nazi uh, Germany uh, relations were uh, unfavorable, but after uh, some uh, reflection, it was decided that some issues could have been regulated. In other words, Molotov responded positively to the Japanese initiative, the uh, Japanese initiative. He said that the mutual relations could improve, but he were already suggesting the um, modus operandi, the European modus operandi, so tit for tat. The Soviets wanted something in exchange for the agreement with uh, Japan. That was made clear in the official response from the Japanese uh, government that came on the 14th of August. Two matters um, are very well seen there. First, the Soviets declined to respect the uh, Beijing Convention as a basis for mutual relations. And following that logic, given that the Beijing Convention gave birth to uh, Japanese concessionaries in Northern Sakhalin, then um, the condition for any future agreement with Japan would be to drop these uh, concessions, drop these licenses in Sakhalin that would otherwise go through um, um, Soviet agents. Am I um, going over my time limits? Uh, two minutes left, please. So let me just give you a couple of uh, quotes uh, that illustrate the further meetings between the two governments. Ambassador Togo meeting with Molotov, 5 of September. If Japan wants to base its uh, relations with, uh, so with Soviets on the basis of the Beijing Convention, it's a mistake. The Portsmouth Treaty resembles a uh, Versailles Treaty, a Versailles Treaty as well. We must seek uh, a basis for mutual relations that wouldn't be uh, resembling a situation from before 35 years, the Soviet Union has changed a lot. The situation takes a U-turn later on. The United government uh, falls. The new cabinet is formed by Fumimaro Konoye, a prince with, with uh, ties to pro-German um, circles. Yosuke Matsuoka uh, also uh, plays a certain part there, and uh, he is a staunch critic of the Soviet Union. We shall not uh, negotiate anything with the Soviet Union, but we would propose a non-aggression pact to it. It's been mentioned many times today already that at that time the trilateral negotiations were taking part. The trilateral pact uh, was signed by the end of uh, September that year. Matsuoka's concept was uh, that this trilateral act was supposed to attract the Soviet Union as a fourth partner. The Soviet Union was offered a sphere of influence uh, 
to the south of the Soviet Central Asia. So it was sort of pushed towards collision course with the British Empire. The common goal was there to eliminate uh, the English. And uh, it appeared that Nazi Germany would be a middleman, a benevolent partner in the normalization of Soviet-Japanese relations, and that they would uh, support the non-aggression pact. That idea failed, however. The Molotov's negotiations uh, ended with a fiasco. The Germans uh, started preparing for the anti-Soviet aggression once the uh, further cooperation positions uh, was decidedly apart and were not, no longer interested in um, improving the relations between Moscow and Tokyo. So the Japanese were left on their own. On the 13th of April, 41, when Matsuoki traveled to Europe, it was the second round of his talks in Moscow, the neutrality treaty was signed. There were no references there to the Convention or the Portsmouth Treaty, and the remainder was just like what the Japanese had proposed. Importantly, a separate declaration was signed about the territorial integrity of Manchukuo, dependent on Japan, and the Mongolian Re People's Republic, dependent on the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union did not receive um, any concessions on Sakhalin, although Minister Matsuoka declared that in the near future this issue would be subject to an agreement. However, the outbreak of the war between the Soviet Union and Germany will change the situation completely. The neutrality treaty was uh, kept by Japan, and it preserved Soviet interests in the Far East. Several times this made it possible to reallocate forces from the Far East to Europe, which was done at critical moments of the European part of the war, and that treaty was one of the key elements why the Soviet Union turned out victorious in the Second World War. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. It is true that geographically speaking, we have moved far away from the main thrust of our conversations. But I think it's uh, just an impression because the Far Eastern aspect was a very important uh, influence. And as we can see, the events in this period are all interconnected. The professor talked about this uh, watershed moment when France um, fell in June 1940 and how fast the Germans were progressing in the West, and that also had impact on the Far East. We have one more presentation, which is a commentary. Our commentator is uh, Dr. Ducking Young, who's, who's at George Washington University, uh, and he deals with uh, Japan's contemporary history and also the relations between China and Japan, and among other things, the very important issue of the post-war reconciliation between Japan and, his, and China. The floor is yours. Over to you, sir. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I, I'm aware I'm the last speaker of a long conference, so I won't abuse your um, patience. But first of all, I'd like to thank the organizer for including me in this program. As a US-based historian of Japan, um, we rarely hear about European colleagues, about what they have to say about World War II. So today, I really appreciate. Um, I've noticed some parallels uh, in the discussion about Europe. For example, the issues of territorial uh, changes, uh, often as a result of the big power politics at the expense of smaller countries. Issues of collaboration have been mentioned. Um, 
and also diplomatic styles between countries have been uh, suggested. I think anyone studying Far Eastern uh, international relations will notice that. What I want to emphasize, however, is the connections between Europe and East Asia. So in the allotted time uh, that is given to me, I will be very brief uh, with three uh, parts. The first is I would also start with some background, but since my previous speaker has uh, covered the path to the Neutrality Pact in 1941, I will take it from 1941, the Neutrality Pact. Um, so for Japan, uh, that Europe and Asia were very much connected, and this was also the same for Stalin. So the idea of a non-aggression pact between the Soviet Union and Japan actually was first suggested by the Soviet right after the Japanese occupation of Manchuria in 1931. Uh, we already heard uh, about the Soviet sales of the China Eastern Railway to Japan, which was located in Manchuria. And this is one indication that Stalin was afraid of facing threats on both Western and Eastern uh, frontiers. And this is a time when the Soviet um, military strengthening and industrialization have not been completed. So in the first half of the 1930s, uh, Stalin took a very uh, cautionary policy toward Japan. And then when the war between Japan and China broke out in 1937, as it has been mentioned, uh, Soviet Union provided considerable um, military aid to China in, in the form of material, but also in terms of pilots. And this is a way to keep Japanese military bogged down in China rather than moving north. And this is the traditional stance of the Japanese army ever since uh, the Russo-Japanese War, especially after the Bolshevik Revolution, which viewed uh, the Soviet Union as a major threat. The Japanese Navy, however, had a different stance. And this is a one peculiar aspect of Japan that is, is a very internally divided political uh, system. The Navy, which operated on resources such as petroleum, uh, were very much aware of the attractiveness of Southeast Asia. Um, so they view potentially a, a war with the United States and Britain as their uh, target uh, in the future. So any military action have to be negotiated between the army and uh, the navy. So let's move now from the uh, neutrality pay pact um, Japan, I heard earlier this morning that uh, Poland uh, foreign policy was to keep Soviet Union and Germany apart. And Japan, interestingly enough, from the mid-1930s on, took an exact opposite position. We already heard uh, from the previous presentation that Japan had even wanted uh, Soviet Union to join the Axis part, to expand into a four-part uh, alliance. One of the key motivations for Japan to do this is to stop the Soviet Union from aiding the Chinese regime uh, that resisted Japan. Uh, as it turned out, this war in China didn't finish as quickly as Japan had wanted. Another consideration is to potentially serve as deterrent to the United States uh, so that Japan would have a freer hand of action uh, in the South Pacific. Now, when the war, uh, when this uh, new, uh, Neutrality Act was signed, uh, as, in, uh, as we mentioned, it did give peace uh, to the Soviet-Japanese uh, border for uh, almost four years. Um, but interestingly enough, uh, just two months after this uh, pact was signed, um, the uh, German uh, launched this invasion of the Soviet Union. And interestingly enough, the very person who signed this uh, treaty in Moscow, Matsuoka, now had a 180 degree turnaround and wanted to 
uh, agree to the German demand to join war against the Soviet Union. So the summer of 1941 till the outbreak of the Pacific War is this one of the crucial moments in the entire World War II. That is, what if Japan did join war against the Soviet Union? Now, the, we already met, hear, heard the uh, discussion of the uh, conflict, border conflict, in 1939, Kahingor, the Japanese call it Nomonghan, where for the Japanese side, it did suffer a military humiliation for the army, and they realized the Soviet army was not easy to crack. So they wanted to have absolute preparation, but also they want to wait for Nazi Germany to score a decisive victory on the Western Front so that they can move north. So in that summer, they actually move as many as 700,000 troops into Manchuria under the name of a special maneuver to wait for that moment, as the Japanese described it, for the persimmon, the fruit, to ripen and fall to the ground. Now, that never happened, and the winter was approaching, and the Navy prevailed to uh, begin action against the United States, which has already instituted an oil embargo. So let me quickly move to a second point that is the difficult issues. Now, obviously, um, before the treaty, uh, uh, the neutrality treaty fully expired, that is, just a few months after the Soviet Union uh, Foreign Minister Molotov notified that it would not be renewed, the treaty would automatically have one more year, uh, but Nonetheless, just a few months later, the uh, Soviet Union declared war against Japan and entered the action uh, on August 9th. So this is one of the biggest difficult issues in uh, uh, Russian-Japanese uh, relations to this day. And related to that is what the Japanese allege to be the illegal occupation uh, by the Soviet Union of southern Kuril Islands, which Japanese call the Northern Territories till today. And then another issue is the internment of large number of Japanese POWs and civilians uh, at the end of the war and uh, the forced labor uh, they have to uh, perform in Siberia and about 10% of them perished. So these are the three issues. And the lastly, I would like to uh, bring uh, to attention to this uh, Russia-Japan history dialogue, um, which brought the historians of two countries together from uh, 2011 to 2015, which is interesting because this was inspired by the Polish-Russian group on difficult matters, uh, which had by that time completed their uh, work and published a, a joint report, which is now available in English, called uh, Black Spots, White Spots. And the uh, the Russian head of the Polish-Russian group, uh, uh, Rector Anatoly Tokornov of the Moscow Institute of International Relations, suggested a joint study with his Japanese colleagues in 2011, right after the, uh, the great um, Eastern Japan earthquake. And the Japanese side accepted, with the exception that it did not have explicit government sponsorship like the Polish-Russian uh, group. Still, they carried out their study and published what they call the parallel history, which is exactly the same format as the Polish-Russian group. Um, so I just want to uh, end my talk about this issue of uh, did the Soviet Union violate the neutrality pact as the Japanese official position has insisted. Well, if you read the uh, uh, chapter contribu contributed by the Russian scholar, uh, he makes three points. Number one, um, by staging large number of troops along the Soviet Manchurian border, Japan was already helping its ally Germany by pressuring Soviet Union so that the Soviet could not move its troops to aid 
its Western Front. And this is partly true. It was not until August 1942 when Stalin finally was reassured by uh, President uh, Roosevelt of the United States based on Japanese intelligence that Japan has finally given up the plan to move north against the Soviet Union that Stalin moved significant troops to Stalingrad as we heard uh, has played an important role there. So this is the first argument that the Japanese had already in effect uh, violated the spirit uh, even if they didn't actually move north. The second is that uh, the Allies, especially the United States and uh, Britain, had first asked the Soviet Union to join the war against Japan, knowingly violating uh, this treaty. They want the Soviet Union to go into war as soon as possible. Uh, and in fact, the, this uh, so a Russian scholar even pointed out that uh, Roosevelt has Suggest, or actually Truman, uh, President Truman, because this is already 1945, uh, July, uh, declined to explicitly uh, give legal support, but pointed to the United Nations Charter, which spelled that in the transition period, the commitment to the collective security under the UN mandate supersedes other legal obligations between states. So this become a, um, an argument uh, against the uh, Japanese uh, insistence. So I think, uh, but this, uh, unfortunately, this does not have uh, uh, reached the level of the Japanese decision makers. And if you look at the Japanese foreign ministry website, uh, the uh, and in also in the popular consciousness, it has a great influence on the very negative Japanese uh, popular attitude toward Japan. For the last 20 some years, it's already always uh, some 70% of the people polled annually by the Japanese government have negative uh, sentiment toward uh, Soviet Union and Russia. So the history of this period has cast uh, a long shadow uh, till the present. So, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for all of these comments uh, where you referred not just to Professor Wojtkowiak's presentation but uh, much broader to the topics of this panel. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, sadly, we only have about 10 minutes left seven minutes left. In spite of that, I will try um, to get some questions from the floor or maybe some comments from the floor. Anyone? Professor Tabinka. I have a brief question to the speakers from this panel, the, uh, the two gentlemen who spoke about Japan. Years ago, I was dealing with a completely different topic, and looking in foreign office documents, I found a report from a farewell to Matsuoka at the Moscow railway station, and it was described in a sort of jocular way. Apparently, Stalin suddenly appeared on the uh, at the train station to say goodbye to the Japanese guest, which was unheard of. How did the Japanese react to this warm goodbye by Stalin? Did they think it was just an accident, or was it considered a gesture? That was April 41, I think. So it was a different time than two months later. Yes, well, the only answer I can give Matsuoka is that Matsuoka at the train station right after a banquet where there had been a lot of drinking. And according to several accounts, he wasn't able to get to the train station on his own as a result of the amount of alcohol that had been drunk. Now, the fact that Stalin appeared there, 
ostentacji, it was czy wręcz prowokacji. Some sort of ostentatious bo według dyplomatów amerykańskich tam miał mniej więcej takie American słowa wypowiedzieć, że gnają z Matsuokę. Teraz, uh, said, kiedy Niemcy i Związek Radziecki uporządkowali Europę, Japonia zrobi porządek w Azji, a później Japan wszyscy razem weźmiemy się ze Stany Zjednoczone. Oczywiście, jeszcze raz powtarzam, pewna ostentacja, bo w tym momencie Związek Radziecki zdawał sobie sprawę już, że wojna z Niemcami jest nieunikniona i tylko jest kwestia, kiedy sam szykował się do wojny. I've been instructed by the organizers that we need to finish at five on the dot. So we have uh, enough time for one short comment or one short question. I'm sorry, we cannot hear the question without a microphone. Uh, this may sound uh, a bit jocular, but there is this prevailing opinion globally that the way the Polish diplomats perceive the international situation in 39 that they got completely lost. But all the documents that I know showed that they knew that Ribbentrop-Molotov Pact would lead to a lot of confusion also on the line between the USSR and uh, Japan, and it seems they were right about that. Ladies and gentlemen, sadly, this concludes our conference. I know we could talk uh, for a long time. Hopefully, this will spur some creative thoughts and inspire further discussion in the future. A big thank you to all the participants, but first of all, to all the panelists and speakers, those of them who were present here in person and also those who joined online, like Dr. Segesh from Vienna. And I would like to thank the organizers. I think this was a very inspiring and a very well organized event. And I would like to thank the interpreters for their effort. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, let me thank Professor Ruski for chairing this session. Apologies for keeping this time so close, but it's also related to some technical issues and also the, you know, the need to respect the working day of the interpreters. I would encourage everyone to buy the first volume of this publication. Uh, the two professors have prepared these, uh, this publication of diplomatic documents. My volume will be available in bookstores in about three weeks, as I said. Once again, a very warm thank you for being here. Once again, thanks to all the participants. Uh, thank you for accepting our invitation to speak. We want to, pu uh, to issue publication as well, so we'll ask you for your, um, for your uh, papers, for your presentations. And again, thank you. Thank you very much for coming. Goodbye.